Tuesday, April 16, 2024. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Breaking news, Reverend Dr. Frederick D. Haynes III has resigned as the president and CEO of Rainbow Push Coalition. Just months after taking the helm, we'll tell you about this stunning announcement. The Supreme Court's conservative majority indicated that it may toss out a charge prosecutors have lodged against hundreds of people who violently invaded the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Ellie Mitchell, the justice correspondent for the nation, is here to break all of this down. The Arkansas State Conference of the NAACP and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law have joined a lawsuit to fight anti-DEI efforts in Arkansas. The director of the Educational Opportunities Project of the Lawyers Committee will be joining us on uh, today's show. It's, folks, uh, also on today's show, more than 18 million black veterans will play a huge part in this year's election. We'll talk to two vets who will explain why Martin. their votes matter. Plus... DEI disruptor Randy Bryant is finally ready to show off her card game, True Thing. So we'll chat with her in our marketplace segment. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Bart Unfiltered on the Black Sled Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Today, the Supreme Court heard arguments on how the Justice Department used a law enacted by a Congress against the January 6th insurrectionists. If the justices decide to toss out this particular charge, it could legally impact uh, hundreds of rioters involved in the attack on the U.S. Capitol. During today's hearing, Justice Brett Kavanaugh questioned why the DOJ charged some January 6th rioters with obstructing an official proceeding which could carry more prison time. Listen. There's six other counts in the indictment here, which um, include civil disorder, uh, physical contact with uh, the victim, assault, uh, uh, entering and remaining in a restricted building, disorderly and disruptive conduct, disorderly conduct in the Capitol building. And why aren't those six counts good enough? Just. Uh, from the Justice Department's perspective, given that they don't have any of the hurdles? Because those counts don't fully reflect the culpability of petitioner's conduct on January 6th. Those counts do not require that petitioner have acted corruptly to obstruct an official proceeding. And obviously, petitioner committed other crimes that we've charged and that we're seeking to hold him accountable for. But one of the distinct strands of harm, one of the, the, the root um, problems with petitioner's conduct is that he knew about that proceeding. He had said in advance of January 6th that he was prepared to storm the Capitol, prepared to use violence. He wanted to intimidate Congress. He said they can't vote if they can't breathe. And then he went to the Capitol on January 6th with that intent in mind and took action, including assaulting a law enforcement officer that did impede the ability of the officers to regain control of the Capitol and let Congress finish its work in that session. And I think it is entirely appropriate for the government to seek to hold petitioner accountable for that conduct. With Joining us right now is... Joining us right now is Ellie Mistel. Uh, the Justice Correspondent for the Nation. Ellie, glad to have you here. Oh, okay, Ellie, so this is where I am um, a wee bit confused. So to hear Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, first of all, has Brett Ka just for just for my sake, has Brett Kavanaugh ever been a prosecutor? No, I don't believe so. He's been a political hack. He worked for Ken Starr. I don't think he's ever um, been a prosecutor, but I'm so, not 100% sure. So a guy who's never been a prosecutor wants to question, why did you, you had these six charters, why do you need this one? I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, 
I don't recall somebody asking a ju asking a prosecutor, hey, why did you hit them with 10 charges? Eight was sufficient. Yeah, so what Kavanaugh is doing right there is that he's basically saying, haven't we prosecuted these people enough? Haven't these patriots and tourists been through enough? Why do you have to charge them with this extra charge, too? He's arguing that the Department of Justice is overcharging people, which is something that Brett Kavanaugh and the rest of the conservatives never do when the defendants are black, right? They never do it when the defendants are Latino. They're never worried about the Justice Department overcharging, over-prosecuting, going too hard against defendants who are of color. But now that white MAGA insurrectionists are feeling the rough end of the Department of Justice, suddenly Kavanaugh is like, no, 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 these other charges are enough. These extra charges, and remember what we're talking about here, the obstruction of Congress charge, that's for the people who went into the Capitol looking for Mike Pence, looking for Nancy Pelosi, looking for the electoral ballots, trying to literally stop them from certifying the election. Over a thousand people have been charged in the connection with January 6th just for the people who broke in and defecated all over the place and, 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 and acted like fools, right? These charges are for the 300 or, or so that we think we're really trying to disrupt the function of the American government, and Kavanaugh is saying, no, 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 that's going too far. You're hurting these people too much. Amazing, because these people actually said it. They actually said, we're going to stop this. So they, they made it clear that they were looking to stop their, from, from impeding them from uh, doing their job. They were kind of these clear. Are the people, these are the people with the zip ties. These are the people, again, as Solicitor General um, Liz Prelogger said in the clip that you played, this is the guy, the name defendant in this case, this is the guy who said they can't vote if they can't breathe. What, what is that, right? So what the government did is they used this obstruction charge that came out of the Enron stuff, all right? And that's where the complication comes, right? This is... And, you know, if people remember Enron, a huge scandal. Um, they did various things to obstruct con Congress investigating that scandal, including destroying documents and whatever. Um, and after the Enron scandal was kind of uh, prosecuted, what the government realized is that Enron was kind of using a loophole, right? Uh, previous obstruction charges, like, you needed a very specific thing, and so— but like this, when you have too much specificity, there are loopholes, there are gaps. And so in the Enron situation, Congress created this catch-all provision. That's what we're really talking about here, a catch-all provision to count obstructions of official proceedings, obstructions of Congress, even if they're not specifically named by whatever Congress thinks of that day, right? So it's a fallback position to catch people who obstruct Congress in a way that maybe you haven't thought of before, right? So when the justices, Thomas, Alito, even John Roberts uh, today, started kind of complaining that, well, the government has never used this before in this situation, Prelogger, the Solicitor General, responded, I think, accurately with, well, ain't nobody ever attacked a, tried to attack the Capitol before. Right! I mean, I'm, like, oh, like, why are you using this? It's, it's the same thing, oh, Colorado, why are you kicking off the ballot? Oh, because, let's see, we never had a president try this? Right? This... This has literally never happened before, and this specific provision in the law was meant to catch things that had never happened before. So it's kind of a direct on-point application and use of the law, but because it hurts white folks, because it hurts, you know, certain people's wives, because it implicates people that the conservative justices like, now they don't want to use this charge. And I'll just bring her back around, because I know you talked about this yesterday, and it's important um, uh, um, to me as well. Think about what they did yesterday to DeRay, right? To DeRay McKesson, who did not start a riot, did not throw rocks at any officers, did not have anything to do with the people who were injured um, in the protests that the government is concerned about. Oh, for them, you know, the Supreme Court can use every stitch of law, every trumped up, re you know, re never used before operation of law to try to go hunt DeRay.
because they don't like DeRay. So they're trying to get DeRay. And so the Supreme Court says, that's fine. But then when you try to extend and use a law specifically designed to implicate the times that we haven't thought of yet, no, 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 now that's going too far. Why isn't what we charged them with already enough, according to the, the conservative Supreme Court justices? So Clarence Thomas is sitting there as a part of this. He's married to a woman who was fully supportive of January 6th. That man should not even be near the bench. Look, I don't, I don't know why he's there. Like, <laughs> like the, you get to the point where, like, if if y'all are, are are comfortable with this level of open corruption, I don't know what to tell you, right? Because it, just as, as an interesting note, Clarence Thomas was absent from the court yesterday. Yesterday they were doing a corruption hearing, basically about a public official who had taken gifts in exchange for official acts. Clarence Thomas ain't nowhere to be found yesterday. He was still on his RV. He was still out on his yacht with Harlan Gray. He didn't want to, he wanted no part of yesterday's argument, right? But today, he's back on the job, sitting there to defend insurrectionists like his wife. The simple fact that Clarence Thomas's wife could have, and I would argue, should have been charged along with the very insurrectionists that Thomas now says shouldn't be charged at all, should disqualify him from this case. And the fact that that isn't kind of like a top-line media story, the fact that that's not going to be talked about in like the New York Times report about this case tomorrow, it's infuriating. And I don't know how to get the country kind of to appreciate just how disgusting this is, just how lawless this is. And I don't know how to get politicians to understand that you need an entirely new ethics code with real teeth to stop this from, to stop, and by this, I mean Clarence Thomas, to stop Clarence Thomas and people like him from ever happening again. Well, um, what's also interesting is that he actually, <laughs> I love this part where he was like, well, is this really that big of a deal? Because weren't they just, you know, doing what people do when they shout out in the middle of a proceeding? I, 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 Th Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch all made analogies to the January 6th protesters as if they were hecklers, right? Like, well, if you can prosecute them for obstructing Congress for January 6th, couldn't you prosecute a heckler who disrupted this courtroom's proceedings? That was yeah, 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 to... yeah. A heckler who decided to come out of their seat and run up to a member of Congress and, in doing so, knock a cop out and then make a beeline for the member of Congress or the city council member. Yeah, it's yeah, the, yeah. You're right. That's the kind of heckler, right? Again, Solicitor General Prelogger had the right answer to that, and her answer was basically like, no, that's not the same, because that heckler isn't making you people run for your lives. And that's what she said straight up to them, right? But the justices didn't care. Neil Gorsuch had a particularly annoying analogy, because he was like, isn't the January 6th protesters just like, I don't know, pulling a fire alarm? during a, an official proceeding, obviously trying to throw some shade at my congressman and my man, Jamal Bowman, who accidentally pulled a fire alarm um, um, in the Capitol. They always like to, like to make a big thing about that on Fox News. So Neil Gorsuch referenced the fire alarm, not Jamal Bowman in my name, but you know who he was talking about, um, in Supreme Court oral arguments today, analogizing what Bowman did to, again, the rioters who attacked the Capitol with guns and zip ties and bear spray looking to do things like, I don't know, hang Vice President Mike Pence. Like, that was the analogy that Neil Gorsuch thought was cool to make today. I, I, I said it online, you got to understand that these conservative justices are basically everybody's white racist uncle who just sits at home all day watching Fox News and then thinks that the world is what Fox News tells them it is. Like, that's that's who these people are, and you saw it today in, in horrible, stark relief. Um, that's absolutely crazy. Uh, Ellie Mistel, uh, any, anything else that uh, jumped out at you that, that just had you um, almost pulling your hair out to a flat top? 
I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, look, I, 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 obviously this case is going to be six three at least. I could even see seven two. Some of the liberals were a little bit interested in the thing. I don't think it ultimately affects the Trump prosecution. Trump is being charged with obstruction of of Congress. Um, the, the charges are different for him because, like, he's literally had fake documents that he was trying to submit to, to obstruct con Congress, which is a little bit more like the Enron thing than less like the Enron thing. So I don't think that it affects the, the Jack Smith case against him. The problem with that, of course, is that the Supreme Court has an entirely different way to defend Trump from Jack Smith. And we're going to hear that next week, next Thursday, when the Supreme Court hears Trump's immunity argument, right? So I don't think this case affects Trump. It's next week where they're going to do um, the dirty work for Donald. All right, then. Ellie, Mr., we surely appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. All right, going to a quick break. We'll be right back on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million, and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, Financial Literacy. Without it, wealth is just a pipe dream. And yet, half of our schools in this country don't even teach it to our kids. You're going to hear from a woman who's determined to change all that, not only here, but around the world. World of Money is the leading provider of immersive financial education <laughs> for children ages 7 to 18. We provide 120 online and classroom hours of financial education. That's right here on Get Wealthy on Black Star Network. What's up, y'all? I'm Devon Franklin. It is always a pleasure to be in the house. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay right here. Mustafa Santiago Ali, former senior advisor for Vital Mode Justice at the EPA out of D.C., Randy Bryant, DEI disruptor out of D.C., Joe Richardson, civil rights attorney out of Los Angeles. Uh, Joe, I'll start with you. What the hell is going on in the Supreme Court? I mean, it's, look, you know what? Just stop even having oral arguments. Just say, right. hey, uh, if y'all right wing, we're going to let you do whatever y'all want. <laughs> this, yeah, this is this is how we're going to do this. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, I, I guess we, we knew it was kind of almost cooked into the cake. I mean, remember, nobody was arrested the day of. You know what I mean? They, they, they dealt with it totally different. You have people crawling up the walls like Spider-Man. You know what I mean? Um, if, if we would have been doing that, that would have been a whole different situation. But what's interesting here, uh, Justice Sotomayor made, a, made an example. She said, for instance, if there's a sign in the theater that says it's illegal to take pictures, run video, or otherwise disrupt um, uh, the theater or disrupt the show, then there will be a penalty. In that case, if somebody yells, I don't think anybody would disagree, this is what she said, that they disrupted it. They didn't take a picture. 
They didn't run a video, but they disrupted. And so on purpose, this law, like Ellie said, was made to have a broad catch-all section. That's why in that uh, uh, law, there's a section A and there's a section B, and the whole talk was about section B. And it is broad enough. It doesn't say anywhere that there needs to be some connection to other evidence. But even if you did need a connection to other evidence, as opposed to this, as pertains to this particular individual, like you said in the last segment, this guy went out of his mind. He went out of his way, out of his whole way, to state what it was that he was doing. He was looking to obstruct, or otherwise obstruct, as they say, uh, obstruction, uh, of an official proceeding, obstruction, influence, or impede. That's precisely what he was doing, or at the very least, it certainly seems that this was the type of person or the type of issue, even though they didn't have them all listed, because it could be exhaustive and incomplete, the type of issue that this law contemplated. So clearly, yeah, there's totally a double standard, triple standard going on here. It's really crazy that the S Supreme Court would minimize basically what these individuals has have done and frankly take a lot of teeth out of the punishment that he could potentially otherwise suffer and the lower courts have approved this so and and have confirmed it so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the supreme court and see how they explain it they'll dance around it and find a way to explain it but it lets you know why we have cause for concern you know what uh, mustafa these people uh will come up with any excuse to let these insurrectionists get off? You know, the Supreme Court, for, for quite a while now, has been focused on the whitewashing of the law. Uh, you know, they make sure that certain people have the benefits of the law, and the other ones are the ones who carry the burden. So we are all very clear that these were insurrectionists. These were insurrectionists who put a plan together of what they were going to do. They were domestic terrorists who attacked both police officers and others. These individuals also, if you slow down any of the tape, you can see the hate and the malice that was in their eyes. And, and they tried to not only obstruct the government proceedings, but to actually take over the government and to be able to find a way to, um, you know, in relationship to the election, to be able to roll it back. So these are the individuals who were part of this process. And this individual who's on trial today most definitely was an obstructionist and is very much in alignment with what the law talks about. So, you know, the, the Supreme Court is going to continue to try to minimize the impacts of January the 6th because it is a political court and because they also know that they need to give something back to the January 6th individuals and those who support uh, Trump because, you know, they've continued to take some L's. So as we move closer to this election, they've got to make sure that, you know, the talking points are that they did something, that President or former, uh, you know, person Trump uh, did something, and, and that, you know, they understand that they've got your back. Uh, and, um, I mean, look, I mean, we say this all the time, Randy. Hello, this is what happens when you vote or you don't vote. Absolutely. What it's like is that you are a team that's playing against another team that's cheating. And you look to the referees to help you out, but you realize the referees are cheating too. And they're absolutely on the side of the other team. We need to ensure that we have referees that will at least call the plays fairly and that we can get some help when people cheat. But right now, particularly when you look at this Supreme Court, as it is, you know, the referees are against us. And um, it, it just makes you throw your hands up in the air. They have tried to make these shameful people, these criminals, um, to, to be just like boys having boys, I mean, boys being boys, just a, another, like they were, I think some people actually were saying that they were tourists and just trying to see the Capitol. So it's, it's incredible to me how, you know, black people are always demonized and yet, um, white people are people, these insurrectionists, mainly white people, are, they're almost trying to put them in the light of just complete innocence. It's disgusting, and it's absolutely scary. Uh, it is, and so uh, we all wait to see what the Supreme Court decision is. All right, folks, got to go to break. We come back. Uh, shocking resignation. After only a few months, Reverend Frederick Douglass Haynes III has stepped down as effective immediately as president and CEO of the Rainbow Push Coalition. We will explain when we come back. 
Terry and I, we couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a, um, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through. You know, we have to figure it out. You know, right. we make we make you know lemons out of lemonade. But there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out. Clubs were sitting empty. They were like, where's everybody at? And they said, they're down watching a band you wouldn't hire. So it taught us not only that we had to be, we had the talent of musicians, but we also had the, ta had the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. And that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We you said, like, no, we're good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Bruce Smith, creator and executive producer of The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, some breaking news. Just months after it was announced that he would become the new president and CEO of the Rainbow Push Coalition, founded by Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III, announced that he is abruptly resigning as head of the organization. This is a statement uh, that was released uh, about an hour ago. Uh, after continual prayer and deliberation, I have decided to step down from the position of chief executive officer and president of Rainbow Push Coalition effective immediately. I remain committed to honoring the rich history of RPC and the legacy of its esteemed leader, the incomparable Reverend Jesse L. Jackson Sr., and more significantly, to the calling and pursuit of social justice. I extend my my heartfelt gratitude to all who have been who expressed their support since my appointment in July of last year. Rest assured that my work in the fight for liberation and freedom continues yours in the struggle, Frederick D. Haynes III. Now, my understanding that a joint statement is being prepared as we speak, uh, a joint statement with from Reverend Haynes as well as from Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. Now, folks, uh, again, we just showed you this here was the video in July uh, that where uh, where Haynes uh, uh, spoke, as you see, uh, sitting behind him. This was uh, at Apostolic Church uh, in Chicago. Was Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. Uh, over Freddie's right shoulder uh, was uh, Reverend. 
James Meeks, longtime chairman of the board of Rainbow Push, no longer on the board. Uh, also, uh, the longtime uh, senior pastor um, there uh, uh, in uh, Chicago as well of uh, Salem Baptist Church, uh, one of the one of the largest churches, the largest black church in Illinois, but one of the second largest black second largest church overall. Uh, he's no longer on the board, but again, that was that. Then, of course, we were in Dallas just a couple of months ago when Freddie actually raised his hand and was installed as the new president. He always shows up to see the one and only legend icon. Video there. So here is the installation video from Dallas, Texas. Founded by Reverend Jesse L. Jackson, Sr., Rainbow Push has a rich history of challenging and transforming systems in the pursuit of liberty and justice for all. And it seeks to empower the vulnerable through the effective use of grassroots advocacy, community mobilization, and issue education. Rainbow Push protects. Rainbow Push defends. Rainbow Push advances the cause of freedom, fights for economic opportunity, educational equity, environmental justice, and the enfranchisement and empowerment of the oppressed and the disheartened. Therefore, it gives us great honor and joy, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III, to announce that you have been tapped by the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson Sr. himself confirmed by the boards of Rainbow Push to serve as the second president of Rainbow Push. Will you please come forward? <laughs> Pastor, do you promise? Now, that was February 1st. Here we are, April 16th, and all of that is now changed. So, what happened? Well, listen, I have, I spent six years in Chicago. Uh, I know a number of different people, calls are out. I've already talked to a number of different folks uh, involved. And here's, here's what you have here. And everyone knows this. And this is not breaking news. The reality is, Rainbow Push Coalition is all Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. The idea that Reverend Jackson was gonna step aside, not gonna happen. And so this is really a fundamental question that Reverend Jackson has to answer, his family has to answer, and the Rainbow Push Board of Directors has to answer, because the reality is he makes the call, not the board. They're going to have to make a decision, and that is, do, how do you want to truly honor the legacy of Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr.? Do you want to have a shell of an organization that has leadership that bends a knee to Reverend Jackson and the family, or do you want to carry forth Rainbow Push further to, to, to the 21st century? We've seen examples. I'm going to use Reverend James Mix as an example. When he, stepped, when, he, when he stepped down and retired as a senior pastor of Salem Baptist Church, he had said years before that Reverend Charlie Dates was going to replace him. And when Reverend Dates became the pastor, Reverend Meeks stopped showing up at church. Why? Because you can't have the new leader there and the old leader and people still gravitate to the old leader. What do you think? What do you think about the sermon? What do you think about this? What about the... A new leader has to lead. A new leader has to bring in their system, has to bring in their people. They have to be able to lead. You can't be in a situation where you're constantly asking permission to lead, not when you are the president and CEO. That's really what happened here. Now, you're going to have a lot of people say, well, Freddie Haynes could have done this and, and the, uh, the family could have done this. At the end of the day, this is very simple. When the decision was made to make Reverend Frederick Haynes III the president and CEO of Rainbow Push, was he truly given the reins to leave? 
Either you're given the reins to lead or you're not. Listen, when the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, when Sheryl Eiffel stepped down uh, as uh, the leader and Janae Nelson became the leader, it was a smooth as silk transition. That's how it's supposed to be. When my man, Reverend Charles Jenkins, when he left, still a young pastor, as a leader of fellowship in Chicago, he replaced Reverend Clay Evans. When he transitioned to his successor, guess what? Smooth transition. That's how it's supposed to be. You cannot have folk fighting the transition. Whether it's a church, civil rights group, corporation, you can't do it. You've got to allow new leadership to lead. Look at Disney. Bob Iger picks Bob Chapik. Guess what? Iger stays on longer, 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 finally leaves the board, pining for Iger to come back. Chapik doesn't last long. Guess what? He gets fired. Who replaces him? Iger. It's because they were all pining for him. So you, you got to make a decision whether you're going to actually move forward. Now, why, why does this matter? Because we as, a, as African Americans, we should never be in a position where we're starting over. We should be starting over. The reality is, Reverend Jackson is still here. He is still among us. But we have to be honest. And it's hard to be honest. The fact of the matter is, because of his Parkinson's disease, Reverend Jackson is incapacitated. He simply can't travel like he used to. He can't speak like he used to. He can't lead like he used to. Which means there must be new leadership allowed to lead. I'll give you a perfect example. And again, I was there. Every Saturday, had their Saturday morning workshop, which dates back to the early 70s. When I was there, mm, save for a few major events, the place wasn't packed. It wasn't 200 people there. So you got this cavernous facility that's being broadcast, and I get how it's done, but guess what? Freddie Haynes or whoever's new leader, they could actually go live on Instagram and have more people watch them live than sitting in the audience. So why hold on to an old model? Here's what I also know. Rainbow pushes a shell of itself financially. They aren't even considered one of the major civil rights groups anymore. I'm just being honest. And so tonight, there needs to be some serious soul searching by everybody involved as to what are we doing here? Are we a museum organization or are we an active civil rights organization continuing to do the work of the people? There are very good examples of egoless transitions where it's done right. I'll give you another example. Bruce Gordon, he was a black man who ran a $24 billion division of Verizon. He became the president and CEO of the NAACP. He lasted a year, but it really wasn't a year. He went to Julian Bond after one week and said, this is not going to work. I'm out. They convinced him to stay, but here's what happened. There was, there was friction there between Julian Bond, who was the board chair of the NAACP, and Bruce Gordon. Now, if you're Bruce Gordon, and you've direct report to the CEO of Verizon, 
and the board, and you ran a $24 billion uh, uh, division, the NAACP budget is chump change. But you had Julian Bond, who wanted to control and run the organization. Even when you have a president and CEO, the chair cannot do that. The leader has to lead. I've run three black newspapers. <clears throat> And every black newspaper that I've run, every single one, every single one, do you know what I said when I came in? I must have complete control of the newsroom. I must have complete control of personnel. I must have complete control of the budget. If my butt is the one that's on the line, then I need to be able to do this. That was every single one. Dallas Weekly, Jim Washington, who recently passed, that's how it was. Now, here's why I left the Houston Defender. I never forget. I never forget. Son of Messiah Giles, who I love to death. We had a meeting. In. So we were, she we wanted to, she she loved the Franklin Covey. So we had to mind map. So she like, we're gonna mind map the front page article. I'm not about to sit here and my map article. I'm an experienced reporter. This ain't my first rodeo. I'm not an intern. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. That's actually why I decided to leave. I'm like, I can't, no. I'm the managing editor. I'm not sitting in a meeting mind mapping an article. Not when I've already been a county government reporter in Austin, a city hall reporter in Dallas, the managing editor of the Dallas Weekly. I'm not doing that. Not when I got awards on my shelf. Not when I was the co-lead writer of the Star Fort Worth Star Telegram with Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building blew up. And I had the, I had the uh, front page byline for the first four days. I knew my experience. I wasn't gonna do that. But guess what? She owned the paper. It was hers. She should be able to run the way she wants to run. I got to go. So what we have to understand what we have to understand as African Americans, whether it's churches, fraternities, sororities, men's groups, women's groups, any organization, we've got to understand that in order for our organizations to be effective in the future, we can't be mired and stuck in the past. We've got to understand that if we went through a proper vetting process, if there was a vetting process here, and there was complete buy-in from the board leadership on down, then you move forward. But the point is this here. You don't pick a new leader and you handcuff them, put duct tape on them, and put them in a straitjacket. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So frankly, all that pomp and circumstance, I feel like, hell, I wasted money flying to Chicago for the announcement, covering it, then going to Dallas for the announcement, live streaming that. We're the only black-owned media outlet that did. And here we are. Rainbow Push is the new president and CEO. So here's what I'll say to the Jackson family. Jonathan Jackson is a member of Congress. Okay. Yousef, do you want to be the president and CEO? If so, do it. Jesse Jackson Jr., do you want to be the president and CEO? If so, do it. Santita Jackson, if you want to be the president and CEO, do it. Jacqueline Jackson, the daughter. If you want to be the president and CEO, do it. If this is perceived as a family business, well, damn it, run it. But our time has was, was been wasted, frankly, over the past 10 months. Wasted. And now, everybody look bad. Now look, breakups happen. Things are not how they're supposed to go. But this is real basic. Are leaders going to lead or are they simply for show? 
And if, if they're for show, say it. But I can tell you something right now. If I was hired to lead, and you're going to tell me up front that I am the leader, I expect to be, to be able to do what I was supposed to do. But if you're going to get in my way, then why the hell did you bring me in here in the first place? Look at my panel here. Randy, I want to start with you. Uh, I've, I used examples such as uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Seamless. Going from Sherilyn to Janae. Seamless. Not an issue. We've seen other examples. Seamless. This is messy. This is not a good look. It's not a good look. And you, you hit on something that those who know me well have heard me complain that I, you know, I love our people, of course, but we do have a difficult t time with change. And I don't know if it's because, you know, we were ripped from our, you know, homeland, but we cling to tradition and old things to a point to the, to, to the detriment of many of our organizations. And I believe we have a difficult time of letting go and a difficult time with change. Of course, all people do, but I think it's particularly tough for us. And it's something that we need to work on because it's important that we progress, that we make progress and we move forward. So I understand that some people probably were giving, you know, people a hard time because new is hard. But we do need new ideas. We do need to uh, move forward in order to uh, to attack the challenges that we have right now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sadly not surprised. We do see this happen quite frequently in our organizations. But I hope that we really try as a community to, you know, support our, our newness, to support our leaders and allow them to lead, while also honoring those who, you know, uh, led the path in the first place. Um, Mustafa, uh, again, uh, there many of us, uh, yours, yours included, was excited about this uh, new leadership, uh, breathing life back into Rainbow Push. Uh, again, Rainbow Push, Reverend Jackson had done some incredible work uh, over the years, but the reality is the organization was not what it used to be. And this now makes matters worse, and frankly, if I'm, if 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 I'm even being considered for the for the job, why would I want it? If I'm not going to be able to run the organization, if I can't come in and assess staff and assess budget and look at needs, look at focus, I, I really thought Reverend Haynes could have been great because the base of Rainbow Push for very for a long time has been Chicago. That's been the base. That's where Reverend Jackson is. But Reverend Haynes is based in Dallas. Well, you look at the, where African Americans are, significant growth in the South. I thought that with him being in Dallas, he could actually establish uh, a second beachhead, if you will, for Rainbow Push and really begin uh, to, uh, to, to push them and advocate uh, in some areas uh, of interest. But none of that actually uh, came to pass. Yeah, I mean, I was excited, too, for Reverend Haynes. I thought, I know that he brings a youthful energy uh, that, that is so critically needed. And at the same time, we also understand that our organizations are needed now more than ever with all the challenges that we have in front of us. We need a strong rainbow push coalition. You know, it's interesting. You, you know, people often talk about succession planning, but oftentimes they're not serious about that. They want certain elements of it. But when it comes to the fullness of turning over responsibility uh, to the next leader, then as we've talked about, you know, people kind of get funny about that. And, you know, they have an opportunity in this moment to actually attract younger people, to get that energy that's going to be necessary for us to fight the battles that we have in front of us. But one, you've got to be able to find the right leader. And right now, if somebody sees what currently has trans, you know, kind of played out in front of us, you know, a lot of the top folks will probably say, you know what, there are some other choices out there. Now, of course, there is the historical aspect of rainbow push um, and, and people wanting to be tied to that. But, you know, there, this is a different day. There are numerous opportunities that are out there. And, you know, top folks uh, will have choices. 
Um, so I wish them well. Of course, I reach, uh, I wish, you know, Reverend Haynes well. Um, but we've got to get serious about making our organizations 21st century organizations. And that means that new leadership has to come in. We can honor our elders. We can honor those who actually help to, you know, move the path for us. But um, at the same time, we're going to have to have some some folks who are bringing some new innovation and ingenuity into this. We've got to be able to embrace them. Look, the, the, the reality is uh, you take, um, uh, Joe, um, people make decisions. Uh, and people make, look, there are corporations, there are companies out there, family-run businesses, where children go along their own way. You know, I know, I know uh, former Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr., he's been focused on teaching. He's been focusing on uh, writing. And so guess what? Again, that's what he wants to do. Good. You don't have to actually take over something and run something. Good. And so, you, so you you do what your passion is, uh, and so you do what uh, in any other uh, child. So, but what has to happen here? And again, and I love Reverend, Reverend Jesse Jackson Senior dearly, but the reality is this here: Reverend has to let go. Reverend has to let go. You have to let someone lead. And again, this is not a question of, uh, okay, and trust me, they're gonna be, well, did, did Freddie do this and he didn't do this? He did. Bottom line is this here. You don't quit this quickly. If, again, what is it you were not able to do? And I don't care what it is, I don't care. I don't care, you take, listen, if, you, if you're a politician, Here's a, per here's a perfect example. Here's a perfect example. Uh, if you're a politician and you elected to Congress, and I noticed, I noticed for a fact because this happened with a freshman member of Congress, and black folks had an attitude. Freshman comes in, they didn't keep the staff of the previous congressperson. They don't have to. They got to bring their own team, Joe. That's how it works. Okay, and so we have to understand that's how it works. And again, the here's what bothers me the most. This, bother this irks me to no end. You have Rainbow Push. Reverend Jackson has done all of these things, has all these relationships, and you've built, follow me here, folks, you built this thing here. And now you have two ways to go. You can either go Higher or go down. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to say this here. And again, I, if folk, if folk, may, folk may, may, may be mad at me if I say this. But I'm going to use two examples in black owned media. That I think speaks to it. And, and Again, this is this is there ain't no personal tax. It's just my perspective in terms of what I saw, or what I also understand because of history. Robert Abbott founded the Chicago Defender. Robert Abbott knew I'm not gonna live forever. So what did he do? He trained his nephew, John Sinstack, to take over the paper and to elevate it. That's exactly what happened. He picked his successor, trained his successor, and then put them in charge to elevate the product. When Sinstack health was failing, he didn't do that. When John Sinstack dies, guess what? The paper in, is in disarray. Family fighting, who's gonna buy it, what's up? That thing was in the course on and on and on, and it just, it was awful, awful. That's what happened. That's what happened. John H. Johnson ran Ebony Jet with an iron fist. The reality is when John H. Johnson passed, the company was in dist dist distress. Why? Because he didn't embrace the internet. Ebony was far behind everybody else because they did not embrace the internet when John H. Johnson was publisher. So all those years building it, and then it comes crashing down. 
Now ebony is a shell of itself. This is, this is what I routinely say about black organizations, black companies, you name it. How do founders position the business or the organization for success when they're no longer here? That's how I determine your greatness as an organizational leader. Not like how you led it, but how you left it. Joe? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're running in a, um, running in a relay, um, and there are several of you, once you pass the baton, by definition, once you've passed the baton, you know, you slow down because you don't have the baton anymore. Theoretically, whenever that person that is to carry on the baton got on board, there should be some unanimity about the goals, right? And that's why they took over. And maybe it's the goal that the person that had the baton wanted it to be. But he might wear different shoes. He might have a different running style. He might be a different height. He might have super long legs. He might have short legs that, that, that go like this, but you still get the job done. So... At the end of the day, what has to happen, whether organizations, I've seen this happen with law firms, you know, people who, you know, want the firm to die with them. If you want that to happen, that can happen too. Or if you want it to be something even you didn't think it would be. By definition, you have to embrace the future and what's going on around the corner. So the question becomes for Rainbow Push, you're notwithstanding everything that Jesse Jackson has accomplished, we all understand that. That's the part we know. We understand his impact. We understand that Barack Obama has him to thank. We understand the things that, that Rainbow Coalition has done, Rainbow Push. But the question is, can it stay relevant? Um, and by definition, whatever organization, there's no disrespect to that organization or to Jesse Jackson to say that you've got to be able to turn a corner. We all know that if... Uh, Brother Haynes has come off this quickly that there's a problem. I mean, you know, the installation, the formal installation was a couple months ago. So, you know, um, it, just like the same fights that happen between organizations, you know, young and old, you know, everybody kind of wants to hold on to power and how it's perceived. Sometimes in the black community, when it comes to civil rights, we want to be the contact person. This, this organization wants to be the person. We want to be the one that people have to pass go to. But Jesse has to, Reverend Jackson has to embrace the future. It's interesting that none of his kids are, are taking it over. Um, um, maybe they wanted something different, and that's fine. But when you put somebody in place to let them lead, make them accountable for leading, but let them lead. Let it go. Because at some point, that's the best part of this thing, is being able to let something fly and become something that's going to battle, you know, connect with all of the challenges of tomorrow. And Rainbow Push has done too much in the past to not have a future. But you have to put the right people in place. You have a moral center, like a, like a, a civil rights organization would. Brother Haynes does that. You have some, some clear goals, theoretically. There's no reason that you, that you can't let go other than to say that yeah. you don't want to, and that's too bad. I mean, and, and look, I mean, and, I, and again, y'all, I... I'm very clear in terms of uh, how I feel about Reverend Jackson. And you know, you know what people have always said? Let me just be real clear. And Reverend ain't never, let, never, never letting go. Reverend ain't never, that, I, I can show, I can name y'all a hundred people, a thousand people, but that's the case. But this is what I will say to Reverend and anybody who's around him the reality is you got to. The greatness of the way you truly honor a founder, the way you truly honor a founder is not to talk about them in an historical context. You honor a founder by talking about them in a present day context. Al Newharth, who was the CEO of Gannett, he is called the founder of USA Today. USA Today still exists. Now, 
is not the same as it was in 1990, in 2000, or even 2010. But today, because it still exists, Al Newhart's name is still mentioned as the founder of USA Today. The family that owns the New York Times, same thing. Even when you talk about the Washington Post, although Jeff Bezos owns the Post, they still reference Catherine Graham. They still reference her father because that's the history of it. So therefore, the Post is not being discussed in an historical context of what was. It's being discussed within the context of what it is. Now, folks might say, well, when Catherine Graham ran it, this happened with the Pentagon Papers, this happened with Watergate, but it still exists. What, so what I am saying is, the worst thing in the world is for black people to invest time, energy, money, prayers into building something and then all of a sudden, watch it collapse. No, powerful institutions outlive founders. Powerful institutions are constantly in pursuit of evolving, changing, and building. And that means that there might have to be a radical departure from how things used to be in order to now operate in a new system or in a new paradigm. And so, I'll await this joint decision from Rainbow Push and Freddie. I will see what it says. But I will say this to the leadership of Rainbow Push. And it starts up here with Reverend Jackson. You've got Yousef Jackson. You've got board members. They now have to decide, what are we trying to do here? What are we actually trying to do here? If the desire is to be a museum, then you know what? Shut it down. It happens. Organizations in, companies in, they phase those things out. They say, we're winding down operations. If that's what it is, do it. But if the objective is for Rainbow Push Coalition to be here for another 50 or 100 years, then they are going to have to accept the reality that it means allowing new leadership to come in and lead, not follow, not trail behind, but lead. Going to a break, we come back. The power of the veteran vote right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support our work, folks. What we are building is something that is about speaking to our issues that matter. And so you could join our Bring the Funk fan club. Send your check and money order, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 2003-7-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. And be sure to download the Black Start Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. We'll be right back. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, it's spring. Hallelujah. But hold on. It's not all fun and games. With the sun and the warmth comes the need to clean the clutter mentally, physically, emotionally, socially. All of those things need to happen. Getting rid of the clutter and clearing the cobwebs in our head and in our home. That's next on A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. The enormous impact of race, education, and affirmative action in America and how Believe it or not, white America is starting to feel a little bit of the pain. 
Dr. Natasha Warrick, who joins us with a case study of one suburban community and how it reacted when the minority students started to excel. And most people didn't say this explicitly, but was that, you know, the academics are getting, standards are getting higher in part because of the Asian kids and that is making our kids really stressed out. So we need to reduce the amount of homework teachers are allowed to um, assign. She shares a perspective that you don't want to miss. That's on the next Black Table, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from LA. And this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together. So let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Parkwa, executive producer of Proud Family. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. last time you heard uh, folks in the media talk about veterans and their concerns, you often hear vote vets, I-A-V-A, -A. you often hear them talk about them, but mm, what about the 18 million black veterans in the country? The concerns that they have that often are overlooked. We're well, joining us right now uh, to talk about this uh, is a veterans advocate and a former Biden administration appointee, Victor uh, Lagoon, as well as Victor, Victor Lagoon, as well as Erica Savage, founder and CEO of the Reframe Free Framed Brain. Glad to have both of y'all here. Uh, Victor, uh, how long did you serve in the military? Uh, Victor, I think you're on mute. Let's see if we can get. That. Is that better? There you go. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you again. So I was in the military for three years before I was medically retired. Um, so I had a great opportunity to serve my country, to do all the great things that you want to do during the time of war. And what I mean by that is really go out there and have an opportunity to demonstrate that not just some people in this country are patriots, uh, but all of us are. Uh, black people have had a stake in this country for a long time, since the very beginning, and it was just my opportunity to continue that service. Erica, how about you? Yeah, Roland, um, definitely served proudly in the Air Force for three and a half years. And so I speak very confidently, along with Victor, around um, the impact of black votes um, and particularly those of black veterans. And uh, while we have um, an opportunity here, I want to also just talk about you touched on this in your book, White Fear, as we get more into the conversation. In chapter four, you talk about the problem with putting America first and connecting the 
historical threads of white fear. And I just want to quote from directly out of your book. You wrote, in the past, we've looked at American history as two distinct periods, before the Civil War and after the Civil War. I believe that is a mistake. This demarcation doesn't acknowledge the continuation of racist policies and brutality against black people after the war. All of these things are connected. So Victor and I are here as a demonstration of the connected thread of policies that have impacted black veterans um, negatively and that there are solutions to those, and that is the power of connection and community. Is there a black veterans organization um, that, that speaks to those issues? I mean, we've had different guests on here. We've talked about uh, the issues in the Department of Veteran Affairs uh, when it comes to resources, different lawsuits that are going on. Uh, and so who is there, is there an organization that specifically advocates for black vets? Victor? So there are several organizations that advocate in different ways for black veterans across the country. And it's important to recognize that I don't look at black veterans as a community that is a monolith. We exist everywhere and within every subgroup. You'll see us on academic institutions. You will see us in healthcare. You will see us in the justice system. You will see us everywhere. So there are many different organizations that support different aspects of what black veterans are looking to do and achieve. And I try to make sure that we are building a more unified front to make certain that there is an active coalition to go out here to do this work, uh, to lend voice to the broader co community and make sure that we are paving the way for the future of other young black service members who want to serve after us. Erica. Yeah, I mean, Black Veterans um, Project is one that's very prominent that Victor and I often reference. They uh, do a lot of information gathering and you referenced about the lawsuits, but also testifying before conference. Congress. And so what Victor and I are saying that we're not mere victor, um, mere figureheads. We are a reminder that particularly when people think about veterans, the picture that is painted usually of someone from the Midwest that usually is not black. Um, and so what we are saying, particularly in this election, as we look at very uh, specific topics that impact all Americans, but specifically that of black veterans around health care, when you're looking at if there is a Trump administration that goes into power again, that they will make sure that the American, that Affordable Care Act is actually decimated. And so when we're looking at ways that our veterans are able to see themselves reflected um, firmly in policies and in ways that they are actually seeing, what we're saying, like uh, spaces like Black Veterans Project, Project are definitely that. But then we're also saying that we're here as veterans who have had different experiences connected to politics. And what we want to do is not persuade anyone on how to vote, but to make sure that those 18 million Americans do engage their vote so that they are actually participating in what policies do impact them specifically around veterans and hospital care. So, Victor, what would you say are the top three concerns of Black Vets? So, you know, I've been able to talk to veterans around the country, and I'm doing a lot of work with Black veterans in particular in the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And there are several key issues that I keep hearing no matter where I go, whether it's Boston or Baltimore or Detroit or wherever. Many black veterans feel like they've been forgotten, like our service only matters while we're in uniform. But when we take off that uniform, we often take on a different fight. And that fight is quite unfortunately uh, with the Department of Veterans Affairs to ensure that we have equitable access to the benefits that we have sacrificed and earned through our service. So that's the number one thing I want to bring up. Number two, Black veterans want to make sure that we, when, when we come home, we want to have the same rights and opportunities to exercise our votes, to make certain that our voices matter in the same ways that we protected other people in other countries to make sure that their voting rights are exercised as well, right? And then the other piece is economics. We want to make sure that Black veterans are able to buy homes. We want to make sure that uh, Black veterans are gainfully employed without having those gaps within employment and also those gaps within who's making what money. So when we start looking at the opportunities, entrepreneurship is another thing that comes up as well. So the economic piece continues to be something that is often said is a key issue, but also making certain that we're able to have those benefits that we deserve, because guess what? Everyone deserves to have what they've earned. And black veterans, like any other veteran, want their fair share as well. Questions from the panel. Uh, Mustafa, you first. Yeah, well, first of all, it's good to see both of you. You know, um, lots of times in, with the uh, uh, unhoused community, some folks still use the term homeless, 
I often notice that many of those are uh, former veterans, and especially in many locations, black veterans. How do we make sure that their voices uh, actually find fertile ground? That's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, for me, that's all of us taking our responsibility to advocate with the loudest voice to, one, make sure that when those veterans come back to our communities, they have the resources they need, that they are not viewed as a burden on their community, but also they're connected to those benefits that they need. Because I'll go back to the key point. If you have stable housing, gainful employment, access to health care, behavioral health and mental health, you're more likely to be successful than not. But when we keep recruiting from poor communities, underserved and resource poor communities, and we're sending kids and, and, and family members back to those communities, we got to make them whole. We have to keep our word as a nation to those people so that, guess what? People are willing to serve again. They're willing to allow their neighbor, their, their siblings, and their children to serve this country as well. So those continue to be the, 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 the key issues that I see that we want to continue to advocate for. Randy? So right now, how are you getting your issues? How are you ensuring that they know how you feel and, and, and that you're out there and that you have opinions? Like, is there some sort of, what, what is the communication? So when you say well, they- I'll, I'll start with this way, um, yeah. Randy, um, just from this lens, because uh, what often happens is just really conversation. So I am a veteran and I am a veteran that um, has uh, disabilities. My disabilities are not service connected, However, because I do have ability to be able to engage at a bit at my own pace, the way that um, we're able to spread the message is through what we're doing right now, talking. So going into spaces like I am a polytrauma patient, patient, so going into those spaces, having conversations with people that their lives look a little bit different because they may have been to war or theater, as we would say in the military, they may not be um, as engaged as other people. There is a large percentage of people, um, and I've talked with thousands of veterans, um, that when they come back from having been in another country on a deployment, maybe they didn't or didn't see theater, that they don't feel like they know that they're placed. So that's where it's um, on veterans like myself and Victor to be able to either create that community or point people to a community that also is connected with if they have disabilities, unseen disabilities as well. So I think, Randy, in the question that you asked, a lot of that is because this community is very much so different. So the onus is on for other veterans to be able to um, engage those veterans where they are in their unique communities and then point them to places that are more generalized to help them with um, specific um, outcomes that are helpful for them. Joe. Yeah, it's just kind of a follow-up with that and a similar question. Do you find that with veterans, um, as it pertains to all the various services that are potentially available because of veterans, because of their veteran status, et cetera, uh, and all the things that are needed, wraparound services, sometimes because they're service-connected, but oftentimes because they're not, as if that, was a, that was a really good point. Do you find that those uh, the availability of those services or the uh, uh, the existence of the extent and the depth of the services are a bit underknown and underutilized by actual veterans? And how do you combat that? There's this matter of here's what we need politically, but there's also this: how do we get these brothers and sisters what it is that they need so that they know that it's out there and they're not disqualified for something just because their disability, for instance, is not veteran related. That's a great question. So, you know, first of all, I do want to make sure we're clear about some things. Sometimes there's disinformation, misinformation, and then no information. And quite frankly, if you're relying on the government to get information to a community, it has to go from one group to a subgroup further down the line. So by the time our community gets the information, do they have accessibility? Is there good quality of care that you would find in other communities? Is there a great opportunity for someone to help you versus deter you from getting what you need through a system. So, you know, it's no easy question. I mean, it's no easy answer to that question. But what I will say is that education and, and, and access are hand in hand for all resources within the black community. So having someone, having organizations in a position that have relationships with the VA, for example, that can be in the community, at the community level, that are trusted, that can make sure that they can make an impact by being that soft touch 
They can hand them over to where they need to go to make sure that they're getting connected. That's the better resource piece for us. And I think as a community, right, you, you'll find, again, you'll find veterans everywhere. So how do we make sure that where when veterans are in most need, other people within those communities are best tooled to support them? All right. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say on that and very quickly, um, Roland, that what it is, and he brought up a very good point around is oftentimes the people that are within community, and that's really one of the great um, um, advantages that Roland Martin Unfiltered has with his platform that is a black voice, a black mainstream media platform that we have the opportunity to come on to say that we're here. And so that community is created by people seeing that they're people that are veterans, people that may not necessarily have seen conflict, but that do face challenges as well. So I do that through the Rebrain Brain so that then those people will be able to, when they have um, further questions around connecting with services, connecting with organizations, because there is no one-stop shop. Even in a hospital, you have several different departments and sub-departments. So when somebody sees a face and a name that they trust, that that person is able to then share or provide services, provide resources for that, that is that um, chain reaction. And we just want people to know that we have not forgotten about Black veterans, that there are um, opportunities that are always coming available to um, allow people to connect to communities and get correct and accurate information. And that's what we're here to do today. All right, then. Uh, if somebody out there that want more information, where do they go? They can reach out to me via Twitter as Victor Lagrune on Twitter. You can also reach out to me at vlagrune at gmail.com. I'm happy to connect you with other organizations that I'm partnering with to get out the word, get out the vote, and make sure that black people have access in their communities. All right, then. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Roland. Thanks, appreciate Roland. You. Appreciate you. All right, folks. Uh, I got to go to break. We'll be right back. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, Financial Literacy. Without it, wealth is just a pipe dream. And yet, Half of our schools in this country don't even teach it to our kids. You're going to hear from a woman who's determined to change all that, not only here, but around the world. World of Money is the leading provider of immersive financial education for children ages 7 to 18. We provide 120 online and classroom hours of financial education. That's right here on Get Wealthy on Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered.
right, folks, uh, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, let's uh, talk about uh, this uh, story that is, uh, you know what, you see this, see this, you're like, really? Remember the story of an undercover cop in St. Louis? Okay, who was shot? Guess what? Missouri judge has awarded him $23.5 million. He's a former St. Louis police officer who sued other officers who viciously beat him during a 2017 protest. Luther Hill received $10 million in punitive damages, $11 million for past and future physical and emotional pain, and almost $2 million for lost wages. St. Louis Circuit Judge Joseph White also awarded Hall more than $213,000 for lost uh, for, for lost, delayed retirement, insurance, and health insurance benefits, as well as about $366,000 for past and future medical expenses. Hall sued former, former officers, all white, Randy Hayes, uh, Dustin Boone, Christopher Myers, for beating him while he was working undercover during a protest after a St. Louis jury found former police officer Jason Stockley not guilty of murder in the death of Anthony Lamar Smith. In 2011, Hall and his lawyers uh, sought a default judgment against Hayes, who did not respond to the lawsuit. A federal judge sentenced Hayes to more than four years in prison for violating Hall's civil rights and other charges. Monday's ruling follows Hall's lawsuit against the city in 2019. He said in the federal lawsuit that the officers truthfully, br sorry, brutally beat him because he was black and used excessive force. Hall received a $5 million settlement from the city in 2021. See, this right here, Joe, goes to show you what we talk about when it comes to black cops, how these black cops, uh, how they are treated uh, when they're not in uniform. Yeah, and he was undercover, right? So let's go back to the story from before about the whole insurrection, okay? So this is what happens when a black protester is protesting, the police are on him. In the insurrection, they were actually on the police, and the Supreme Court is threatening to undo it. But in any event, as it pertains to this case, there's three defendants here. Um, they've got the first one. This particular guy is in jail, so he got defaulted, didn't answer, and so he basically went to the dance, went to the judge by himself. What I'm hoping for his sake, I'm really glad for this judgment, um, Hopefully, it draws attention to this problem. Those two other cops are still out there, and they, he's already gotten money uh, from the city itself, where the pockets are, theoretically. I was hoping, I would be hoping, that the city would be picking up that whole situation uh, as it pertains to these individuals. But if they were, then they probably would have answered, et cetera. But I'm hoping that it's going to end up being collectible, because I don't want him to have a paper judgment. He's already gotten some money. But hopefully, this draws attention to this issue of what happens when black folks um, uh, can protest, et cetera. He's out protesting as undercover, and this is what happens to him at the hands of cops. Yep. So I'm glad that they are criminally liable, and I hope that they are civilly liable to the extent that he actually sees some money from them. Let's go to Dalton, Illinois, where the top administrator for controversial Mayor Tiffany Henyard has been indicted for bankruptcy fraud. During his bankruptcy proceedings, Keith Freeman is accused of underreporting his income from the village and the township. Freeman works for Dalton Mayor Tiffany Henyard as well as Thornton Township. She's also a supervisor there. Uh, and uh, who has been scrutinized for her spending and leadership style. Uh, Freeman uh, was also uh, the registered agent for the Tiffany Henyard Cares Foundation, which is, which is accused of receiving much of its early funding from the township and failed to document. Now, remember when she was on this show, she de de said she knew nothing about this foundation until we actually pulled the records. Freeman lives in Orland Park, charged with one count of bankruptcy fraud, which carries a maximum sentence of five years in prison. See, I kept I, see, folk were sitting here just running their mouths, mad at me with the interview. But I, I kept telling them, Randy, uh, sometimes you gotta let a folk talk, and they you let them keep talking, talking. Let them keep talking, and then they're gonna have to explain themselves later. You are absolutely right. And what this case reminds me of, I tell people, I remember when I was growing up and I'd be hanging out with the little kids in the neighborhood and they happened to be all white. 
for a period of time. And my mom would always say, look, don't think you could do what they could do. Don't think you can get away with what they could get away with. So, you know, we always hear about corruption in organizations, particularly the government. But I don't know why my sisters and brothers thought that they, too, could get away with this stuff. It's not, it doesn't work like that. They're going to go down. And, I mean, we, we, we see it happening all the time. And it's unfortunate, but I, I, I think that's what we're going to see. Oh, absolutely. A federal judge rejected Rudy Giuliani's request for a new trial in a defamation case brought by two former Fulton County election workers. In December, a jury in the U.S. District Court uh, of District of Columbia awarded Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss more than $148 million in damages because Giuliani falsely and repeatedly accused them of voting fraud in the 2020 presidential election. Giuliani, uh, guess what? later filed for bankruptcy, and it's unclear if Freeman and Moss will recoup any money from the former mayor of New York. He also he also appealed the jury verdict uh, as well. And then, he, look, Mustafa, he was just on a panel the, the other day, I think it was today, uh, still blaming them. I say, do what uh, E. Jean Carroll did to Trump, take his ass back to court and get another judgment. Yeah, I don't know what it is about the folks who are part of that whole Trump sort of circle where they just want to talk and talk and talk and keep getting themselves into deeper and deeper situations and deeper debt. So, yeah, hit them in the pockets. That seems to be the only thing that will get their attention when they actually have to start to dole out those dollars. But, you know, some of these folks, they, they it's their privilege. Their privilege actually makes them believe that they can say and do anything. They can defame others, but when it comes to people actually pulling the receipts on them, then they want to get all tight. Um, so, yeah, Take, take all them dollars out of his pocket. Uh, indeed, indeed. All right, folks, hold tight. One second, we come back. We're going to talk about uh, this lawsuit out of Arkansas to deal with the anti-DEI efforts taking place there. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. The enormous impact of race, education, and affirmative action in America, and how, believe it or not, white America is starting to feel a little bit of the pain. Dr. Natasha Waraku joins us with a case study of one suburban community and how it reacted when the minority students started to excel. And most people didn't say this explicitly, but was that, you know, the academics are getting, standards are getting higher in part because of the Asian kids and that is making our kids really stressed out. So we need to reduce the amount of homework teachers are allowed to um, assign. She shares a perspective that you don't want to miss. That's on the next Black Table, only on the Black Star Network. Farquhar, executive producer of Proud Family. Bruce Smith, creator and executive producer of The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. You're watching Roland Martin. Folks, there has been a massive, massive attack against DEI uh, in this country. I was reading a story today where 116 different colleges have either eliminated or significantly changed their programs, uh, and that is going to continue. Now, we've seen these attacks against DEI take place since the Supreme Court's uh, ruling uh, as it related to affirmative action in colleges. And so conservatives, white conservatives, they've been attacking uh, programs in corporate America, law firms, you name it, going after any program. Lawsuits against the Minority Business Development Agency, lawsuits against the Commerce Department's 8A program. These things uh, have, have continued to happen, uh, and it uh, shows you ex exactly what the game plan is. Now there's an effort to fight back in Arkansas. Joining us right now uh, is David Hanosa, director for the Educational Opportunities Project for the Laws Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Uh, y'all have, are y'all seeking an injunction in Arkansas? Explain. So we have yet another rogue 
governor and a rogue legislature cramming down a very clearly unconstitutional law that attempts to censor critical discussions on racism and systemic racism uh, in America's you know terrible but truthful history. And so we have a governor and state legislature who are embarrassed about that history and want to keep children from learning that history. They want to keep t teachers from teaching that history. And so we're seeking uh, an injunction against this law, which is known as Section 16 of the LEARNS Act, although this isn't do, doing much about learning. So um, they passed the law in Arkansas. Sarah Huckabee, the governor, signed it into law. And so your contention, your contention is that uh, it's, it, it's unlawful and unjust. How is their law different than what was passed in Florida and some other states? So it's basically another example of a law similar to the Stop Woke Act in Florida, similar to the Oklahoma classroom censorship law, in the sense that they are trying to censor critical discussions in classrooms and to keep students from gathering information and ideas. However, however, there are a number of um, problems, you know, with the Arkansas law, because they want, they are targeting uh, teachers if they feel like they are forcing students to profess, affirm, or adopt a particular idea that somehow runs afoul of equal protection laws, which that in, its, in and of itself doesn't run afoul of equal protection laws, you know, just mere ideas. But take Mr. Gilbert, one of our clients, a debate teacher, which at the core of his work is having students adopt and affirm and then defend a particular position. But with this law in place, he doesn't feel comfortable, you know, having certain discussions uh, in classroom that students want to engage in, but he feels he cannot because he fears that because of this vague, overbreath, overreaching law with draconian, you know, penalties for students or for teachers that could be enacted, that he's afraid that any day that he goes into school, that he might say the wrong thing and it might be his last day. And that's certainly not the climate that we should want for our uh, Indeed, uh, indeed. Uh, questions from the panel. Look, school. Uh, Questions from the panel. Uh, Mustafa, you first. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for everything that you're doing um, in this space. I'm curious. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act says that you can't utilize federal funds to discriminate. And I know there's a difference between intent and effect. But I'm curious if folks are looking at, at Title VI. So we are, uh, we do have a 14th Amendment equal protection claim. So that is a racial discrimination claim. Because the state is targeting, for example, this isn't the only thing they're doing, but the state is targeting AP African American Studies course because they say, well, this runs afoul of our law. But many of the same topics like intersectionality, right, that's been gaslit. And as one of our uh, teachers says, you know, it's a bumper sticker for the far right wing, you know, to mobilize around. But in Actuality, you know, it is a topic. It's a serious topic. They are concerned about the roles of race and gender, for example, impacting uh, impacting society together. Uh, but they've only singled out AP African American Studies courses, not courses like AP European History, that also look at those issues. That also look at resistance and resilience among, you know, minority populations in Europe. And how and why are they only targeting AP African American Studies course? Does it is it because that course enrolls over 50% of students in Arkansas public schools compared to all the other AP courses that enroll roughly around 11 or 12%? Is it because the majority of Black teachers teaching those courses, or, or the majority of teachers teaching those courses are Black? We feel it has a lot to do with how they are applying uh, this law, and we intend to prove it in a court of law. 
Joe? I'd be interested in how you feel. Thank you for what you're doing, for sure. Um, interested in how you feel about the judges at this level. I, I, I imagine you're in a circuit court or, you know, you're at the first level in terms of uh, bringing the federal lawsuit. Um, how, how do you feel about uh, the judge and the court that you're in uh, in terms of potentially getting um, um, a fair hearing as it resolves? And how do you feel about um, uh, the possibility of getting an injunction um, to hold off from the enforcement of this underlying bill uh, while the litigation continues. Yeah, well, these are very serious claims and very, very serious charges, and we have a lot of evidence supporting these. We feel that no matter the judge, you know, and this is in the Eastern District of Arkansas before Judge Rudofsky, uh, but we feel he will give us a, share, a fair shake. He will give, you know, students and teachers power-wide, can the state get away with, you know, censoring their instruction, censoring their learning? And we believe these are really serious issues. There's been courts across the country from New Hampshire to uh, Florida, among others, that have weighed these issues and have not dismissed these claims and or they've also issued injunctions against these laws because it's not something that's right or left, conservative or liberal. It's about our Constitution. And we think that you know, judges, all judges, uh, are very concerned about those type of constitutional violations, especially when they impact the rights of teachers and students. Randy? Randy? Doing as a workaround. I asked that I, 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 what are students and administrators doing as a workaround? I ask that question because, you know, these things can take some time. And I, through my, through my uh, work, have found that many colleges, universities, uh, organizations are coming up with solutions where they are not breaking the law, but also ensuring that children receive a well-rounded and diverse education. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that the incredible teachers that we represent, including Ms. Walls, Mr. Gilbert, the teachers of the NAACP Arkansas State Conference, you know, the members who are teachers there, that they're doing their absolute best. They're trying, you know, really hard to get their students, you know, to learn, you know, the critical lessons that they need to so they can become educated citizens themselves. But we also know that they are censoring themselves right now. Uh, Mr. Gilbert no longer uses the book Warriors Don't Cry, which was, which was written by Elizabeth Eckworth, uh, one of the Little Rock Nine. And he doesn't feel comfortable using that. But that's how and why we're seeking a preliminary injunction. We're telling the court, hey, stop the presses right now. Stop the enforcement of this law. And let's get back to teachers teaching the best that they can the way that they know how to do it and not freezing up their instruction, not cutting out materials and whole units that have been excluded by some teachers to make sure that students get the information they need. And the students that we represent too, Sadie Bell and Giselle are, are incredible students. They know the value of this information and ideas. They're thirsty, they're hungry for it. And that's how and why they're putting themselves on the line for the better good, including the student members of the NAACP as well, uh, to make sure that this law isn't furthered anymore and that it is stopped. All right, then. David, we appreciate it. Keep up the great work. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lori. All right, then. All right, folks, uh, we come back. Uh, we'll chat with Randy about her truthing card game. What's this, truth or dare? Is that what it is? <laughs> we'll talk about that. Also, I'll sh share a little with y'all from last night's uh, concert with Who Did a Blowfish at their Monday after the Masters golf weekend. It was fantastic. We're going to close the show out with that.
You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Of course, support us. Join our Breed of Funk fan club. Your dollars are critical for the work that we do. Send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 200-37-0196. Cash App is Dallas at RM Unfiltered. PayPal R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. I was just in my backyard. I just said I was manifesting about life. I said, I would love to come back because it was a great time. And these kids need that right now. They need that 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 male role model in, in, in the schools, I think. Even right. on TV. Because well, yeah. people are scared to go into the high school. You know, the high school, you know what I mean? I, I would love to bring it back. And I think we could bring it back. And I, you know, what do you think? I think I think we'll just ask the people. I want to ask your people. We'll do a poll. Y'all want to hang a Mr. Cooper? Yeah, I say, let's go. We all look good, you know, Ali looked good, you know, Raven looked the same, Marquise, Don Lewis. It'd be funny to have the bullshit you see out there on TV now. God damn. What the fuck? What happened to TV? Uh, yeah, damn. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's some, I'm like, oh my God. is Lena Charles, and I'm from Opelousas, Louisiana. Yes, that is Zodico capital of the world. My name is Margaret Chappelle. I'm from Dallas, Texas, representing the Urban Trivia Game. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you watch. Roland Martin on Unfiltered. So, you know what? You have dinner parties, you have get togethers, and you know, sometimes folk play Uno, or they might play Spades, Bid Whiz. Um, but uh, Randy Brown decided to come up with a uh, game called uh, Truthing Cards. So, uh, these are her Truthing Cards right here. Uh, it says here, time to have a conversation, Truthing Cards. Uh, share your truth, listen to the truth of others, grow from both. So, uh, these Truthing Cards. All right, Randy, so um, what the hell are Truthing Cards? <laughs> well, listen, I, you know, my DEI experience and my experiences growing up really informed these cards. Um, as a child, I used to sit around the table with my family. It was a big deal to, you know, advance to the adult table. But we had conversations about matters, like important matters, right? We'd watch 60 Minutes or something and then have a conversation um, as a family. And I believe it really helped me with my decision making. It helped me where now I'm sitting here on, on your show. And it really helped me to learn just what di different generations thought. You know, there's so much diversity within a family. Um, and then also being in DEI for the last two decades, I really realized that black people don't tell the truth. We very much present a watered down version of ourselves to the world because we have to somewhat whitewash ourselves in order to be accepted in society. And we need these areas, these safe spaces to share our truth, which is exactly what you do on here on your show, um, where we can just let our hair down and, and speak how, exactly how we feel. And so I wanted to create some cards to start these conversations that are not just based in sexy red or puff daddy or whatever, but cards that really help us grow and to think as a community. All right, so, so there are a hundred cards. Okay, hold on, hold on. So, yeah. um, all right, so I'm looking at some of the questions. All right, yes. so is this supposed to be a fun game or is this supposed to be like an intellectual, go deep, put the brown liquor down type of game? I, I suggest still having your brown liquor. 
um, <laughs> if you want it. Um, I would say some of the some of the questions are light, um, where you're discussing, you know, what movie must every black person see? And it's very interesting, you know, to hear the conversations um, to very deep about, you know, do we do we have our black leaders and what is slowing us down? Um, regardless, I will say this. I've been having these truthing sessions with my family and friends and now on a, on a show where regardless of what the question is, it's up. Us, right? So there's going to be some humor. People, we laugh, we, we joke, we cry. It's everything. You know, it's, it's a conversation with Black folks. It reminds you of the barbershop and the beauty salon. I mean, there are a bunch of discussion questions out there, but what I found is that none of them were for us, specifically for Black people, black topics that affect our lives. So I just, I created these cards just for us. Um, and they were so popular and, and there were so many questions. I still have questions that I've now come out with another set that are questions specifically for um, black people to discuss our issues candidly, you know, do our truthing. And I did finally come out with a third version that is rooted in my experiences in diversity, equity, and inclusion that people would, could, they're more corporate. They're for anybody. They discuss issues like our privilege, our biases, uh, race, sexuality, ableism, uh, size, disparity, all of those things. All right. So let's see here. So let me go through here. Uh, so one of the questions, would you take a job where you made 20% less money over another job if the lesser paying job had a majority black staff? Why or why not? All right, let's see. Another question. Um, do you immediately notice when you are, one, you are the only, only or one of only in a space? How do you feel? What do you do? Uh, another one, do, 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 do. Um, what advice would you get of black people younger than you? All right, cool. Do musicians own some responsibility for the drug culture and violence? You trying to you trying to create some violence with these questions. All right. <laughs> no, no, we have great discussions. Like we I was just um what movie did I watch yesterday? And um it, and it, thought of, it made me think of one of my questions. It says, can you be pro-black if you are married to a non-black person or only exclusively date non-black people? I mean, that conversation, and I get to realize, I've had these conversations, and they go on and on and on with people's um, opinions. Um, do social organizations, this would be a good one for you, Roland, do social organizations like sororities, fraternities, the Lynx, Jack and Jill, make black people closer? Or do they create more separation? Um, that has been, you know, brought up some really interesting conversations. You know what people have to say, and uh, but some are, some are just fun. You know, some okay. are just fun, but some are deep. Like, have you ever felt like a token? Um, do you mute your blackness in certain situations? In other words, do you code switch and win? Is it effective or not? Um, can black people be successful in America without code switching? Is it possible? So, I mean, but there's some light ones in there too, you know, about, uh, especially about music and art, dance, movies. Um, one of the best conversations I had was, is there, is CP time real <laughs> or is it a myth? I mean, people went off at that whole uh, conversation. I didn't know how upset people would get about CP time. So yeah, I mean, I have, I would say in my, um, you know, I've written books, I've done certain things, but these cards are something that makes me really proud because I believe that's how we bond um, as friends and families. And that's how we hear different perspectives. Um, I believe we think that black is one thing and we certainly are not monolithic. And it's good to hear how other people think. That's what helps us grow. I think that's what creates uh -huh. bond. And, you know, I want us, I want us to get together as a people and as a community. All right, questions uh, from your fellow panelists. Mustafa, you're first. Well, Randy, congratulations for creating this thought-provoking uh, set of opportunities there. I'm curious, you know, with some of the questions that you have that take people into a pretty deep uh, sort of uh, area, what happens once those conversations begin uh, and people open up and they become vulnerable? Um, where do you then send them for the deeper sets of information to help them on their journey? Send them outside the patio. Yeah, I, I tell them to pour another, uh, some more brown liquor um, and maybe people calm down or, you know, I'll tell you this, the conversations get tense. 
But listen, we play spades as a people. That's what you call tension in the, in the, in the black community. So they do get tense, but I, I, will find, I will tell you that there's not one conversation I've ever experienced that there's not laughter woven within, because, you know, we will create jokes out of everything. Um, and, you know, I have people who call me, text me, send me pictures like we had such a good time last night discussing, you know, ABC and the third. So it's th that's why it's something that has fulfilled me, because the comrade people are talking and talking about things that matter. All right, then. Uh, Joe, but don't send them to me though. If they're if they're real upset, I, don't call me. I'm I'm done. What, you know. <laughs> no, call her. Call her. Don't Joe, call me. we we've been doing this for a while, Randy, and I have to apologize because I'm just getting to see your website and and looking around and all the cool stuff. So my first question was going to be, and it got answered once you mentioned that there's more than one edition. What yes. page was that on? Because the packet didn't have the right page, but I've got that. Okay, okay. now. I'm regular, and since, you know, I know you enough on the show to, to, to say I need to support Randy anyway, I'm going to get two editions, all right, like two copies, all right, not one, but, and I'm going to pay full price, but <laughs> for the regular people that are not on Roland Martin with you, don't have that privilege every other Wednesday, every other Tuesday, however that goes, will there at some point be a discount code? <laughs> You're in luck. <laughs> it's cheap ass asking for a discount code. I'm paying full but, price though, Roland. But, but if you go to RandyB.net, you, you know, know somebody I know want to know. Up. Always want to somebody I'm but, Hey, somebody I'm related to want to know. I'm gonna pay full price though. I promise. I'm gonna tell you. I'm no, gonna pay. I, I don't mind. I don't mind the discount. <laughs> Listen, I'll set this up. If you buy them on randyb.net, that's R A N D I B as in boy, dot net, you get 20% off if you put Roland 20 in there. So it's just for those of you who support and watch Roland and hit the like button every every week. You hit that like button. Every day you hit that like button. But Roland 20 will give you 20% off if you go to randyb.net or you could just buy them on amazon.com. I got it. I got it. And so I'm just telling you what it is, Roland. You know people going to be asking. Now, come on. Man. My mother going to call you right now. Joe, Joe coming on here just... That, that, <laughs> he even asked no real question. His, he's like, oh, yeah, I got a question. What a dis... You are family now. He, he, ain't got, <laughs> he, asked no, he asked not a real question. <laughs> he going to come in here, uh, what a discount hey, at. Wanna, I'm going to patronize Randy's business. Now, we going to do this. Now, that's what's up. Well, come in here. That that's your question. What a discount app. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Randy again, where, where can folk get the cards? Amazon.com or randyb.net. Um, and you can listen, send me pictures of you truth and so I can highlight you. I'm loving the conversation. That's what makes me happy. I truly did this out of the the out of my heart my passion to make black people, I want us to have these conversations like we have every night on um, Unfiltered with Roland Martin. It's important that we talk. It's important that we bond and unite as a community. And that's what conversation does. All right, then. So y'all get, get the truth in cards uh, and uh, give the promo code again for folk like <laughs> Joe. We ain't, got no, real, we ain't yes. got no real questions, but he sure want to ask about the promo code. <laughs> RandyB.net, the promo code is Roland20, or you can pay full price for right now. We do run specials on Amazon.com, but not right now. Um, but you can go to Amazon.com and pay full price, you know, if you want to do that, if it's easier. All right. I'm going to go to, I'm gonna go to, uh, I'm gonna go to Amazon, just so you know. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Mustafa, Joe, Randy, I appreciate y'all being on today's show. Uh, thank you so uh, very much. Folks, for the last um, uh, sa uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, uh, I was at uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, hanging out with uh, Hootie and the Blowfish, my man Darius Rucker. Uh, and so last night, they closed it out, the House of Blues. Uh, they brought out all of the uh, celebs on stage, a lot of entertainers. 
uh, were there uh, last night. I was shooting video, so I would have been on stage. But you know, you you can't you can't do both. Uh, so wanted to end the show uh, with how they ended the show last night. Shout out to my man Darius for inviting me. Had a great time uh, playing in the golf tournament. Uh, and so uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And so Darius and Hootie the Blowfish, take us home. Holla. Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! I'm a real uh, revolutionary right now. I thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
peace and welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Elijah Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Folks, we got a dynamic show for you this afternoon. First and foremost, let's talk about how one black running group has filed a major lawsuit against the Boston Marathon claiming racial discrimination. We'll give you the latest details and check in with Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Folks, there we go, working out the kinks. Welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation, folks. We got a lot of great, uh, a lot of great discussions for you um, as we're going to be checking in later on, talking about um, supporting Black entrepreneurs here in the city of Los Angeles. How one organization is doing that. Also, later on, we're going to be discussing how we're honoring Black jockeys. And how black jockeys will be honored for horse racing at the event at the uh, industry's biggest race at the kentucky derby we'll have that but first let's talk check in with our sister amber webb sims who's an attorney co-host of the po- broke ish podcast and she's going to talk to us about two things one is a major lawsuit that was filed against the boston marathon by a black running group uh we'll have that discussion and later on in the moment we'll also talk about how black men are wanted for former President Donald Trump's hush money trial. Really? Now you need black men to help you in a little jam, Mr. P- former President? Okay. All right, let's check in with my sister, Amber, uh, who's always bringing us her insight and, of course, some of her legal expertise on the issues. Amber, welcome back to the culture. How are you this afternoon? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Always a pleasure to have you. All right, let's first talk a little bit about this black running group that has filed a major lawsuit uh, against the Boston Marathon. Um, This is the group of the Trailblazers, Trailblazers Running Company, um, and they're filing a lawsuit. Uh, The Lawyers for Civil Rights LCR filed the suit on behalf of Trailblazers Running Company against the Newton Police Department and the Boston Athletic Association. Uh, And let me just share with folks what this means and what does this lawsuit entails. Take a look at this, this quote quote one, thank you, that the uh, LCR filed this lawsuit against Trailblazers Running Company against Newton Police Department, BAA, Boston Athletic Association, asking the court to enjoin racial profiling and harassment against the running group and its members. In addition, 
the group seeks redress for emotional distress and trauma caused by last year's racial profiling incident here. And, you know, this is an issue that we're seeing. Um, let's throw up quote number two, please, Lisa, and I want to get um, Amber's take on this. According to the complaint, which was filed in a federal court in Massachusetts during the 2023 race, the MPD, Newton Police Department, singled out spectators from Trailblazers Running Company and other running crews that serve primarily people of color, racially profiling, targeting, and harassing them. This allegedly occurred near Mile 21, where the group organized a designated cheer zone and had extended the invitation for other running groups led by people of color to join, per the complaint. More than 100 mostly people of color spectators were gathered together. Wow. Wow, Amber. Major, major lawsuit here. Talk to me. What, what do you make of this? Um, and is this a lawsuit that um, you think that the uh, Trailblazers uh, running group will be able to win? Well, I think the Trailblazers are definitely taking a page out of the NAACP's handbook and how they chose to file their original complaint with the court. Because one of the things they did, um, like the Trailblazers with civil rights litigation, is they included documentary evidence, which is normally not something you have to do when you file um, a, co a complaint or a lawsuit despite what a lot of people think, you actually don't have to include evidence. You have to lay out your allegations in accordance with the laws that you are seeking to file your lawsuit under. So um, what they did was they included photographs, photographs to show how they were having their people treated differently than other spectators at different mile markers. So for example, they included a photograph of a demonstrator feeding a runner a donut, of demonstrators being allowed to cross the lines and celebrate and congratulate runners. And then they showed documentary evidence of how the primarily black and brown celebrators at mile 21 were being treated differently. And so I think they are definitely coming out of the gate swinging to show that they have a viable 14th Amendment violation that they are alleging in seeking this recourse against the Newton Police Department and the Boston Athletic Association. So if if this is the situation and, and you know, this is something that they're doing right before the next marathon that kicks off this year in a few weeks, uh, but they're, they're already looking at trying to at least make some headway on this. How far will this particular case go given the time frame that, that, that we're talking about here? So generally, lawsuits are <laughs> marathons and not sprints, which means that they can take a while. But part of what they are seeking here is injunctive relief in joining the Newton Police Department from policing the mile 21 marker the same way that they did last year. And that is a type of emergency relief. So we can expect a ruling on that part of the lawsuit at least pretty fast, because obviously the runners want that part of the lawsuit resolved so that their, their um, spectators will not be subject to the same type of conduct this time that they were allegedly subjected to in 2023. So I suspect we'll have a ruling on the injunctive part pretty fast. The part where they're seeking money damages and all of that, that could carry on, I mean, even into the 2025 race. So we might not hear a final judgment on that for a while, but we'll probably hear something on the injunctive relief part pretty soon. So they're saying in the complaint, uh, Amber, that they have this has been a tradition for the last four years, arguing Correct. that they had, this mild market is a very is of special importance. Uh, according to Trailblazers, they said it stands as a key place where runners of color are acknowledged and celebrated helping create a powerful and affirming experience for runners of color. But during that race, Newton police officers allegedly formed a human barricade separating them from the, them from the course. So, I, I, I mean, for something like this, it would seem like video would be the critical part of this, this whole process. That is, or is that, is that, am I, am I thinking this correctly? No, you're absolutely right. That's why I said that earlier that they were taking a page out of the NAACP Civil Rights Litigation Handbook, including that documentary evidence with the complaint. So I, I suspect they will have video evidence later on. But for now, they have attached pictures showing white spectators 
you know, clearly engaging with the runners, not being subjected to police harassment or police interaction when they were getting close to and interacting with the runners, which begs the question, why all of a sudden are things being handled differently if these allegations are true at mile 21 than they are at places where predominantly white onlookers congregate? Because yeah. why are people being allowed to feed the runners, congratulate the runners, touch the runners at other mile markers, and then you are raising it to a different level of enforcement at a different mile marker? And if the only distinguishing characteristic that is different is race, then that actually does run afoul of the 14th Amendment. All right, we're going to take another quick pause. When we come forward, let's continue to talk a little bit about this. Plus, Amber, I got to get your take on this effort from Trump's uh, lawyers in this hush money trial, this criminal trial, where they are actually seeking black men to be on the jury. Child. Amber. I'll, I'll save my thoughts. <laughs> Amber. We just getting heated up, y'all. Amber Webster is joining me. Y'all know how we go. I want you to post your comments. And I didn't even mention, big shout out to y'all, the online culture crew. But thank y'all so much for tuning in. Make sure y'all post your comments as we scroll and stream it on Big Brother Roland Martin's social media page, on his Facebook page, on his YouTube channel. I would love to get your take on this case around the Boston running group and also uh, what's going on with this Trump trial. Uh, this is the second day of the trial. Jury selection started yesterday. And so we're, we're talking about it. I want to get your take on it. So stay with us. We still got a lot more to cover here with Amber Webb Sims and you right here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. State of the Union 2024, huge night for President Joe Biden. This was a CBS receipts type of night. Yes. He dragged the hell out of the Supreme Court. And he said, <laughs> y'all don't see the power of women. Trump's brain is melting as we speak. We want to organize from a place of strength. There's no confusion whatsoever about what they've done and what they plan to do. What Donald Trump is doing is presenting a fallacy. He is convincing them that he's all in it for them when in fact he's all in it for himself. We do not feel Joe Biden in spite of the success that have taken place during this administration economically. There are too many things where we do not feel like he's had our back. You should also be investing in the barbershops and the beauty salons and the hookah bars and the folks who are going to the club and there's a way to actually get them registered because we've done it before. But if you don't have folks who understand that dynamic, then you're missing a big opportunity. So we said we just celebrated. For what? Why did you go to Selma to celebrate rather than recommit yourself to the fight if the very thing we went to celebrate has been gutted? Republicans did not support a lot of the bills that were necessary to keep the country fluid. You can't only love your country when you win, right? Oh, no. You guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? This was absolutely the knockdown drag out that we were really waiting Black for. voters are the base. They're the most important base of the Democratic Party. There was very few language in this speech at the time we see an attack on black history, an attack on DEI. The end of the BLM racial reckoning thing has come to a complete end because there was nothing in this speech for that. Our movement has never been grounded in two-party politics in this country. All of our movements ultimately get co-opted by a state that is anti-black. They called the old because they knew the way, and they called the young because they were strong. And I believe there is a good combination of that, but we can have ideas and we can have visions and dreams, but we have to have our young people also working beside us because they are strong, and they will run that race, and they will run it to the end. Activists, organizers, and young people have been pushing this administration to be on the right side of history and to do something about the issues that they care about. While the Ukraine and Palestine are critical issues. They are not the only global issues. Not a single black person who should ever let it come out their mouth that I'm tired. 
because there is somebody else who came before us who didn't stop fighting. All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. We've been checking in with my sister, Amber Webb Sims, who is an attorney and co-host of the Broke-ish podcast that can be heard on all streaming platforms. And Amber was just bringing us up to speed and giving us some understanding and insight about this case with the Boston running group Trailblazers, as they have uh, filed a lawsuit just a few days ahead of the 2024 Boston Marathon, alleging that their 14th Amendment rights were violated during last year's race. So my, my question to you, Amber, is do you think that, that, uh, that this is going to create the type of change? You know, the conversation right now about, if you talk to folks about Boston and how Black folks have historically been treated in Boston, Racism is at the central part of, the, of those conversations. Do you think this will push the needle any further, that it will open up the doors for some different discussions about Boston and its culture? Well, yeah, I think that this definitely creates the possibility for that, because remember, um, the, the federal lawsuit not only creates the opportunity for there to be money damages, but the federal judges have a lot of latitude in creating um, frameworks to create uh, a pathway for future accountability, you know. And so uh, they can, for example, order the Newton Police Department to turn over certain data, um, to turn over certain information about how they are policing, who they are arresting to ensure compliance with whatever federal ruling comes down. So. I mean, it's not a perfect solution. In a perfect world, we really want to overhaul and a reimagining of policing, right? Because we know right. that um, American policing is rotten to its core and is a direct linear descendant of chattel slavery. But in the meantime and in between time, it is important for groups like Trailblazers to ring the alarm on the federal level when they feel like there are instances of racialized policing happening because really, that's the best recourse we have right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's going to be interesting to see how the city of Boston is moving forward. I remember hearing the mayor talking a little bit, and this was some months ago, where the mayor apologized to the Black community for its racist policies of segregation and redlining and all of those things. Um, so it seems like there could potentially be some um, accountability that the city of Boston may take, but when you have entrenched racism, deep-seated racism, it takes time before you can uproot that. And mm -hmm. um, even in a simple thing of a running event, how it can be just something simple to being something very, very complex. And I think that's the interesting part about this story, that it's just a running event. Like, why make it a big deal if runners are saying, look, we want, we want to use this mile marker, we want to we want to create a cheer zone and then, you know, and you still like, oh, no, we're going to do a balloon arch here. We're going to make it harder for black, you know, spectators to, and black runners to, to intermingle with the crowd. And it's just like, bro, we, we, we got to fight for every single inch of respect and humanity. And, and there's this always this underlying fear like, well, it's going to be returned. It's going to be reciprocated. And it's like, no, nah, it's not. We just want to we just want to be respected as the human beings that we are and we deserve exactly. That. Exactly. And I will say, because a lot of times when these types of lawsuits are filed, black people particularly are accused of be, being overreactive. We are accused of running to court. But testify uh, the trailblazers had several conversations with the Newton Police Department with the Boston Athletic Association leading up to this lawsuit. And they were not able to reach an agreement. And the chief of the Newton Police Department stated with his whole chest that he stood by everything that he did. And so in cases like this, where you talked about, for example, the, the level at which policing is entrenched, it's very difficult sometimes to get the state actors to recognize the extent to which their behavior is problematic 
which oftentimes leave people no choice but to pursue the court as the only alternative to get meaningful change to occur. Absolutely. Absolutely. That This is, like I said, we're going to have to keep our eyes on it as we look at this situation. Well, folks, we're going to take another quick pause. When we come forward, Amber, let's talk about how President Trump's uh, uh, defense team and his hush money trial are taking on a new strategy, and that is to look for black men to sit on the jury, in the juror as a juror. Wow, hmm. really? This is going to be interesting. We'll talk a little bit about this defense strategy and a whole lot more as we bring some coverage of the hush money trial that the criminal trial that President Trump is in that started earlier this week. Folks, stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. I need you to scream for your new beginning. Five, four, three, two. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Joined by our one of our great uh, legal contributors, Amber Webb Sims, who is an attorney and co-host of the Broke-ish podcast. And um, y'all make sure y'all tune in to Amber because she's always got something to say, talking about the stuff that's just broke-ish. The broke stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I'm so happy to have my sister joining me. All right, so let's talk about defense strategies. Amber, this is right in your neck of the woods. Yes, yes. But this is the weirdest defense strategy I think I've heard before in a long time, right? It's not Where that weird. President, uh, say it again? It's not that weird, and I'm going to tell you why, but go ahead and finish. You it's want to tell me why? All right, so here's the yeah. situation, y'all. Former President Donald Trump, we all know that his hush money trial started this week started yesterday. They are in the jury selection phase of this trial. Now, the defense strategy, those who are the lawyers for Trump are saying, hmm, how can we ensure that we get an acquittal in this criminal trial? Hey, I know. How about we reach out and try to get as many black men on the jury because black men pay porn stars? I'm not sure. Anyway, this is a very real strategy that the uh, that President uh, Trump's defense attorneys have started to do as they are seeking young black men jurors who they believe could be persuaded to acquit the former president. Uh, it was reported in the New York Times on this past Sunday that the lawyers are hoping to spot sympathizers and will focus on younger black men and white working class men to be on the jury. 
Now, Amber, I want to give you a chance to go in and do what you do best, which is what the hell kind of strategy is that? And how racist is that? That you so, want to try, this is the same guy, and I'm gonna just put this in a proper context. Trump is the same guy that when stuff happens with black men, he's the first to say that, you know what, we're animals, we're lower than, you know, we're scum, we're doing all of these things. He talks so bad, he denigrates our very existence, but you want us to sit on the jury to hear your story and to be a potential sympathizers? Yes. Okay, talk to me, Amber. What's, what, 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 what's going on here? So I'm going to tell you why. This is a very well-known strategy. Um, I'm a former family violence prosecutor, and there are uh, a certain sliver of cases where particularly Black men are thought to be very effective jurors, according to a lot of juror research. And one of those types of cases are cases that have to do with interpersonal dynamics between men and women. And there are a lot of practitioners, lawyers, trial practitioners who play on the pathology that is deeply rooted in the Black community. That's sort of what happens in our house stays in our house. So when something happens between a man and a woman, it's supposed to stay between that man and that woman. And that is why the disinformation campaign regarding what the real issue is regard about this Stormy Daniels thing has been so effective. Trump's team has done a masterful job of making this about, well, it's not illegal to pay somebody hush money. If he wants to give that woman money to keep a, an affair private, that's his business. And so that is a, a, a trope and a pathology they are trying to play off of. However, comma, that is not the legal issue. The legal issue is not that he paid someone to keep an affair private. It is that the funds were paid and then illegally mischaracterized as election funds when they were paid back to Michael Cohen, Trump's former attorney. Right. So Donald Trump had his former attorney take out a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, to pay it so that it would fly under the radar because loans are not income according to the federal government. So he took the loan out, paid her, and then when he was reimbursed by the Trump campaign, that happened out of campaign finance money. And that those funds were characterized as reimbursements for legal, legitimate campaign expenditures. And that is the issue. But what Trump's attorneys are hoping to do is to muddy this and make this about a man trying to keep his personal business personal and knowing that that is something that deeply resonates with black people who have historically been stripped of the rights to privacy and autonomy within their own family. And so this idea of keeping personal business personal deeply appeals to black male jurors, particularly. And they are trying to play on that trope to distract from what the real issue is. So, they, so, so I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand, Amber. Where does black men, where does trying to bring black men onto the jury have to do with this? Is, is this a, because it seems a little, I'm offended because you're trying to say yes. that as a man, I'm supposed to ride with another man who's trying to keep his personal affairs private. Right. That's what that's exactly what they think. That men so it's are supposed to be like, hey, men do men things and we cover yes. up with one another. Yes, that is you are hitting the nail right on the head. That is exactly what they are trying to. That is the pathology they are trying to capitalize off of. This idea that men will be sympathetic to another man, and all he's trying to do is keep his personal business personal. But that is not the issue. That's the issue they made it about in the trial. You can keep your personal business personal all you want. What you cannot do is lie about it and take funds that legally have to be earmarked for legitimate campaign expenses and use those funds to reimburse your lawyer for paying off hush money and then lie about what that money was used for. That is what you cannot do. But they are hoping to muddy that and really just say, oh, this was a man who was trying to keep his family intact. And they know that the people who are most likely to resonate with that argument are young males. All right, well, then you know what? Let's ask some black men that are always in the chat. I love my brothers in the chat. I love the brothers of the culture crew. Uh, guys, is this the case? 
do you think that this is a, a good strategy for Trump's defense attorneys to take on to try to um, get an acquittal? And, you know, it makes me go back to two things. It makes me go back to that stage appearance that we saw at Chick-fil-A with Trump in Atlanta. That's, it was stage, folks. And it also makes me go back to the comment when Trump made saying that because he was indicted and going through all these legal challenges that black folks would understand. Hey, man, like we have a similarity. We got something in common. I got problems with the legal system. You got problems with the legal system. So, hey, I'm your guy. And, and you know, I think a lot of times in, the, in cases like this, I think it is very, very important, one, that we remember who we're talking about. We're talking yes. about the same man that took out a full page ad in the New York Times years ago, slamming the uh, former uh, Central Park Five, now the Exonerated yes. Five, and calling them all types of names outside of who they are, and, and basically saying that they were responsible for that tragedy, which they weren't. And, and creating a campaign of hatred around this. This is the same guy that does it. Now, that was back in the 80s. He's continued exactly. through the 90s, through the 2000s, in some way, shape, or form, has um, in, in not only just embarrassed, but insulted the intelligence of Black men on numerous occasions. And, of course, leading up to this year's presidential election, we're seeing more comments and things like that. So I, I'm trying to understand, do they not be believe that, do they not, maybe it's just me, but as a defense attorney, do you like read the room and say, wait a minute, Trump, I don't think this is a good strategy because your relationship with this group of people, with these men, there's not a good relationship. Listen, birds of a feather flock together. So the same way that he is, that Donald Trump is delusional and divorced from reality, what we have seen is that those type of people attract a very particular type of lawyer. And it is usually not lawyers who are competent or lawyers who care about their reputation. And so, first of all, even if that is a strategy you were going to use, the fact that these people that don't have enough sense to not even talk about it, <laughs> that in and of itself is indicative of everything you need to know about them. But also the fake solidarity, I think that the, any, the fact that this prosecution is being led by a black district attorney, he is going to be ha have a lot more latitude than most attorneys to call the bull crap for exactly what it is and to stand up with a very justified sense of righteous indignation to encourage the jurors to see exactly through the fakeness and the phoniness for what they are trying to do and how they are trying to make this into a man being criminalized for a personal issue, as opposed to a man who jumped through hoops and over and above bridges to try to conceal illegal activity. Absolutely. Shauna Marsh, my sister, checking in. Uh, Shauna, welcome back to the chat. You said they are foolish if they think this will work. I don't know what caliber of black men, as far as I know the men I grew up around in New York City and most of my male friends don't like him. But I feel like, and I, Shana, I agree with you, I just feel like some of us, and I'm talking about my brothers, some of us got this kind of a la carte type of rem remembrance. You know what I mean? Like, we're like, oh, well, he did that, but did he, he, he stood for this. And I think it's just this weird, distorted, this is much deeper, Amber, but you can certainly speak on it. But I feel like this is this weird, distorted view of masculinity and manhood that's at play here. Just as much as this is a racist trope, right? There is this, this ugly distortion of what manhood looks like. If, if you're talking about, first, bro, you cheating on your wife. So, okay, yeah, people cheat every day. But how many black men do you know is going to be like, you know what? That guy cheats on his wife. I cheat on my wife. I, therefore, I get it. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's this very weird, ugly view of what manhood, masculinity is supposed to be about. And then going back to that original point that you made, Amber, talking about that we kind of cover up for one another. I'm not covering up for a joker who don't give a damn about me. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think this is also a place where, again, we forget that intersectionality matters. So in as much as he is trying to capitalize off of maleness and the bonds of maleness, he forgets that 
there is a very real way that black men experience life in this country that white men do not. And so before any of the men on this jury are men, the adjective that precedes that is black. And so I think that what happens is that you have these people who are not taking into account an intersectional framework where yes, there is definitely a maleness and a male privilege about this, that is very real, this idea that men stand in solidarity and sort of cloak other men in, in protection when they do these underhanded and less than integral things inside of their families. However, that is not the same thing as a Black man being willing to overlook a white man taking positions that are adverse to his literal survival. And so I just think that... Um, they are grossly overplaying their hand and the extent to which maleness will trump blackness in this equation. I like how you said that maleness will trump blackness. You, you, you're pretty good with the words. I like how you said it. Look, we're going to take a quick pause when we come forward. More conversations, get more comments from you. Stay with us, folks. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, checking in with my sister, Amber Webb Sims, attorney and co host of the Broke Ish podcast. Um, and we're talking about how Trump's defense attorneys are now um, talking about using the strategy of trying to get more black men on the jury, as well as white working class men as well. So, you know, their, their, their approach is look, we need to get some men on the jury. And I love how you said it, Amber. In a, just a few moments ago, talking about creating this cloak of brotherhood around Trump so that it can lead to an acquittal. Like, what? I can't speak for white working class men. I can't speak for that because that's not my that's not my reality. But I, I have to say this, Amber. The more and more we hear this guy or the people around him or just any type of anything related to this guy in terms of the view of how this guy sees himself how he sees other people, how he moves in the world. It just becomes more and more clear that if you are a black man <laughs> or a black woman and you go all in for Trump, it's like something, I, I do have to question your sanity and your intelligence at the very same time. I'm gonna be honest with you. And I know some people might think that's harsh, but it's not harsh because I would rather you to say, I'm not gonna vote at all rather than for you to say, well, I understand. But the thing that I think that works in Trump's favor is that he will get you looking one way, looking this way, looking up and looking down to the point that you're moving around so much, you don't you don't recognize what's right in front of you. 
Yes. And I think that's part of the strategy is creating chaos, 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 misunderstanding, yes. double talk, all this other stuff. So you, you, your, your brain is trying to process it all. And then when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of a situation, you don't even know which way is up. You don't know which way is the best way to yes. deal with it. I mean, it, that's what I think is the best strategy. Confusion, then compliance. Yes. And I also want to just say to the people who are trying to, to, you know, miss the point and be intentionally obtuse is that Trump's attorneys are targeting the same demography of jurors, the same demographic that defense attorneys in domestic violence cases target. Those the, the same jurors they're going after are the same jurors that criminal defense attorneys go after in domestic violence cases. They go after working class white men and black males because wow. they believe they believe that those are the men and those are the jurors who are most likely to say that don't got nothing to do with me. If, if they want to fight, I, I, they're the most likely to acquit a criminal defendant in those types of cases. So be very clear about what is happening. Be very clear the strategy that they are using. Be very clear where they have placed this and how they are trying to do this because it tells you everything you need to know about who this person is. Right. That You know what? I never knew that. Yes. that The most jurors statistically who are most likely to acquit in domestic violence cases are black males between... 18 and 35 and working class white males. Those are the jurors in the demographic most likely to find that the state has not met its burden of proof in domestic violence offenses and acquit male criminal defendants. Wow. Yes. You put me on to something there, Amber. Yes. Wow. And you know what? It speaks to me. This speaks, this is, this goes to a much of a much larger picture than Trump as an individual, but it speaks to the culture of domestic violence, rape culture in this country, right? That as men, we have embraced it to some degree. We've embraced some level of rape culture and abuse, and it takes for us to be very intentional in our thinking and for us to be very uh, intentional in our own consciousness that we don't continue to either advocate for it or that we don't even, you know, because it's about power. You know, rape yes. is not about sex. It's yes. about power. Yes. And if you look at, and, I, and now that you said that, it kind of makes sense because black men, we don't feel like we have power in the, we don't feel like we have power in our homes, in our communities, and in the world. So when you're talking about power, then you're talking about the same thing for white working class men right now where white working class men say, oh, I got to get my country back. I don't have any power. I used to be on top. I used to have the privilege. Now that's being challenged. That's being challenged by black women. <laughs> that's being challenged by this new consciousness that's emerging in this country. So it speaks volumes, but I think it goes volume. It goes back to what I said, like that rape culture that now we even have to ask ourselves the question, are we normalizing certain behaviors and certain mindsets that opens the door for domestic violence to happen, for infidelity to happen, for disrespect of women to happen? Do Are we just doing this to ourselves as men? That's exactly right. And we have to interrogate a lot of the things that we believe for so long, like what happens between a man and a woman stays between a man and a woman. What happens in the house stays in the house. A lot of those pathologies are the exact pathologies that attorneys play on in strategies like this. Well, it's none of our business. What happened between that man and that woman? If she wants to take his money and not say anything, that doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm not going to get involved in that. That's their business. If that man wants to pay that lady and then she doesn't say anything, I, it's not my business where the money comes from. Well, no, it's not our business where the money comes from when it is properly and legally designated. But when you go through steps to illegally conceal campaign finance monies that are yeah. donated by people to fuel a public campaign, that is illegal. And that is why we have to keep making the main thing the main thing. But his attorneys, like you said, are going to do a very good job probably of trying to make a muck trying to confuse the issue and make this about a situation between a man and a woman that is personal, that has nothing to do with law enforcement. 
And, and very quickly, we got about 30 seconds left, but I, I, I want to get your take. Like, how far, or how, how successful, because some of the critics that was written that, that against this strategy, um, saying that this is, this is insane, that this is not working, but as a lawyer who understands jury selection and who understands this process, and I don't know how many of those individuals that were quoted in the article um, understood that this is not just about Trump, but in all domestic violence cases, black men and white working class men are often the go-to people. So how far do you think that this strategy will go? How successful do you think this, this will be for the defense attorneys of Trump? Well, I think if the prosecution stays vigilant, because we have to remember, juries are not selected. People are actually deselected. So you deselect and then who you're left with becomes your jury. And so one of the most powerful tools in an attorney's toolbox is the right to raise what is called a Batson challenge, which is based on the Supreme Court case of Batson versus Kentucky, which states that it is illegal to strike a person from a jury for their, their race, their sex, their religious orientation. And so I believe that if the prosecution stays vigilant and asserts Batson challenges, if necessary, against this defense strategy, where we see them striking disproportionate amounts of women or black women or white uh, white women or or non uh, or people who don't fall into the dem demography demography they're uh, targeting. Yeah. Hopefully, the court will sustain those Batson challenges and refuse to allow the defense to strike people for illegal reasons. So let me ask you this question, and before we take our next pause, um, this is coming from uh, Lee Royster Jr. He said, Faraji, is the Trump team capable of identifying the specific dynamics of isolating those characteristics in Black men for potential jury selection? How is that done? Can you speak to that, Amber? So you have an opportunity, we call it voir dire in Texas, but voir dire uh, is the opportunity for attorneys to be able to ask very targeted questions to jurors. And a lot of times you don't even ask questions about the issues, but you ask questions that give you indicators of whether people are the people that you want that are most likely to do what you say to do. So, for example, when I tried cases, I asked people what, what, what channels they watched at night. Do you have bumper stickers on your car? What do you listen to in the radio? And so, yeah, the attorneys will be able to ask questions that will give them insight into whether or not they believe that certain people will be um, sort of inclined to agree with the arguments they anticipate making in the trial. Mm. Okay, okay. This is going to be very, very interesting to see how this whole thing plays out. But I am so happy that you gave us some context and some background of how this particular strategy is used, and not just in this case, but in domestic violence cases. And it speaks volumes. It really speaks volumes about the, not just the issue of culture with black men and white men and, and rape culture, but also speaks volumes about the, the criminal justice system, the, the judiciary, the judicial system, that they have this formula that if you want to get a man who has been uh, you know, found guilty or who, who's facing allegations of guilt for mishandling, mistreating a woman, that the best course of action is like a cheat code is to get black men and white working class men. I mean, that's, that's pretty sad, Amber. That's it very, is. very sad. And, and, you know, I think we need to have some deeper conversations about that because we need to change that. We need Absolutely. to change that. The, the men should not be the ones to let men off of the hook when women are disrespected or mistreated or abused and all of that. Like, it can't be. Cindy D, one of our great culture crew members, she said, Trump don't want black uh, any woman on the jury. And we know that's the truth. Absolutely. We, we don't want, he don't want no women, let alone he don't want black women on the jury. That part. That, that, that is it. Uh, Amber Webb Sims, I appreciate you as always for thank you so much for your legal expertise and ex insight. How can people find you on social media and tune into your podcast? Uh, Brokers can be found anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can follow me at uh, Amber W. Sims on Instagram and you can follow Brokish Podcast at Brokish Podcast. So thank you for having me, Faraj. Thank you and we truly appreciate you and we look forward to having you back on soon, Amber. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank y'all. Absolutely. All right, folks, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, let's talk about 
black men who are doing some very positive things. We're going to be checking in with the group or organization that's doing this part to advocate for black jockeys to be honored and to be shown the proper respect they deserve at this year's Kentucky Derby. We're going to have that conversation up next. Also, we'll uh, we'll we we'll want to look at the issue, some other issues that we got on the on the agenda. So stay with us. We got a lot more to cover in the second half of the culture right here on the Black Star Network. We wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. This is an opportunity for us to be able to speak to our issues. Y'all better understand something real quick. We ain't going nowhere. It is a continual battle that we see all uh, across this country. Revolution will not be televised. The revolution will be streamed. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. He makes sure that our stories are told. Roland Martin's doing this every day. You can't be black on media and be scared. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. Folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation as we've been having some great discussions. In the first half, we talked, checked in with my sister, Amber Webb Sims, attorney and co-host of the Brokish Podcast, to talk to us about the, um, the latest case uh, with Black running group Trailblazers and how they're following a lawsuit against the Boston Marathon for discrimination and racial profiling. We talked a little bit about that, and we talked about how former President Donald Trump's defense attorneys are employing a strategy of trying to get more black men and working class white men on the jury to possibly lead to an acquittal of a former president for this hush money trial. So we will see. And there's some breaking news that has have come happen that there have already been six members of the jury that have been sworn in for the trial. So this is moving along very, very fast. And again, folks, for former President Donald Trump, this is a criminal trial uh, and he is facing prosecutor Alvin Bragg in the state of New York. So we'll certainly keep you up to date on all of the latest developments as we've been streaming what's been happening on a, on a trial on BlackStarNetwork.com, as well as uh, make sure you stay tuned to Roland Martin Unfiltered. Now, speaking of the network, make sure you go to our website today at BlackStarNetwork.com. Download the app for free. Follow us on social media, and we would love to connect with you there. Just follow us at Black Star Network. And more importantly, we ask for your support and to be a donor, to be an investor, to be a stakeholder. So your support makes a world of difference. It means everything to us. Without your support, we can't do the work that we are called to do here. So your support means everything. So make sure you drop a little something in the bucket for us. And we're also streaming on Amazon platforms. Make sure you check us out on the Amazon um, on Amazon News on your Fire TV. Make sure you check out or check us out on Amazon Prime Video where you can find us at the, uh, on the Prime Video app under Live TV The News, or find us on Amazon.com under Prime Video The Live TV The News. We're on the Free V Network, so make sure you find us on now under um, Black Star Network for News, as well as Plex TV, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just search for Black Star Network or find us under Live TV The News and Opinion. Um, folks, now we want to do our due diligence to uh, honor brothers who are doing the work. They're not going to sit on the Trump jury. These are brothers that are doing something else more special and much more impactful 
that we're going to be checking in now with um, the group Black Menswear, which is a cultural impact organization and collective global group of professional Black men who have exclusively partnered with the Kentucky Derby to curate a national tour and a series of events across the U.S. to bring more awareness to the historical underpinnings of Black excellence that have been at the foundation of horse racing. And so they kicked off this tour earlier this month uh, in cities such as Los Angeles and Oakland, and they're continuing to do this tour during the, uh, the racing season. And this tour will, will include events such as a derby fashion show, culinary inspiration and cocktails. They'll be educating audiences all across this country about the legacy of black jockeys and how they were some of the earliest winners of the this Kentucky Derby. Many people don't know that fact. And they also are um, talking about how black jockeys have dominated horse racing and made the Kentucky Derby what it is today. So we want to welcome down to the uh, Culture Heal of the Black Star Network, Neandre Brosser, who serves as the CEO of Black Menswear. Neandre, thank you so much, brother, for joining me today. How are you feeling? Nah, thank you for having me. I feel really good, man. I feel blessed to be able to share this uh, this platform with a good, strong brother like this. Oh, Thanks. brother, we're trying to do our part. You know what I'm saying? You make me feel a little over underdressed right now because you sharper than you cleaner than a board of health, brother. Neon. Uh, you, know, yeah. you gotta represent. I gotta represent. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I talked a little bit about the work that y'all doing. Y'all, it's interesting because your name of the organization is Black Men's Wear, but you're really about cultural impact, taking you know, having these very important, like, educational conversations, uh, and you also combined it with fashion. Yeah. So so talk to me about the inspiration behind Black menswear. Man, so, so you know, the, the, the movement behind Black menswear is all about empowering uh, Black men in our community to feel good about themselves, to feel motivated about themselves, uh, and then also feel as though they're not on an island by themselves, right? And this movement that we had really sparked out of uh, a lot of the police brutality that we saw uh, in the late, you know, the middle 2000, 2015, 2016, that sparked a cry on our end to showcase more positive imagery of black men. Uh, we fast forward that to our flash mob movement, which has, you know, uh, 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 taken over really kind of kind of uh, uh, the branding of our organization to where we bring hundreds and hundreds of black men together around the world. Uh, we just you know, had a, a weekend last weekend in, in, uh, in Oakland that made it to the shade room <laughs> last night um, right. for positive imagery of black men uh, in Oakland, which those stories of black men in Oakland are, are overwhelmingly negative, which was the reason why we started this platform, started this community, uh, because we want to compound some of this momentum in our community that gets that gets black men uh, uh, forward thinking, more progressive and less uh, uh, constructive constrained to what society tells us that we are not, right? Society tells us that we aren't worthy. Society tells us all these things about ourselves. So really being able to take our platform and to shed more positivity on Black men is, is, is really how we got here today. Look, I got to take a quick pause, Brother Neandre, but I, when we come forward, I want to kind of get your take on, you know, why is it important? And I, and I know it's important. Yeah. Why is it important for us to honor Black jockeys now and and what has been the holdup since then? You know, what, you know, with your organization having this exclusive partnership with Kentucky Derby, that's big because we know that horse racing is still a very yeah. exclusive yeah. event. Let me yeah. just say that right. Yeah. It's a very exclusive event. So we want to talk a little bit about the work that y'all doing on that end on the other side. Folks, stay with us. We're checking in with Neandre Brosser from the CEO of Black Men's Wear. I would love to get your take on this crew as we're talking about honoring black jockeys at the Kentucky Derby. You stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. 
another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us this is an opportunity for us to be able to speak to our issues y'all better understand something real quick we ain't going nowhere it is a continual battle that we see all uh, across this country revolution will not be televised the revolution will be streamed all momentum we have now we have to keep this going he makes sure that our stories are told roland martin's doing this every day you can't be black on media and be scared All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Farajah Muhammad, joined by our very special guest, Mr. Neandre Brasser, who serves as the CEO of Black Men's Wear. As we talk about honoring black jockeys at this year's Kentucky Derby, and uh, Neandre, again, we thank you so much, man, um, for, for being with us today. Um, talking about the work that y'all are doing, yes, an intersection of history, an intersection of history, fashion, and social justice, which is interesting. You got to love Black folks for, for our originality of creating this space like this. And I'm wondering, why is it important for us to even have a conversation about Black jockeys this year? Not to say that it shouldn't be, but for those who might be saying, well, why are we even talking about this? What, what, is, was there any particular moment, event, something that caused us to say, you know what, we need to stop a little bit and reflect on what black, black jockeys has done for this game and more important, what it's done for this part of the culture. Talk to me about that, brother. Yeah, so so to be honest with you, man, this is actually our year two with uh, with Woodford Reserve in the Kentucky Derby, right? So last year, it's kind of like you, you have your uh, test out moments. And so when we talked with them last year on the, the, the Derby experience, uh, there was within our conversations, it's like, well, how do we make this make sense to us as a culture, right? Because you, you hit it the, head, the nail on the head earlier. Um, the Derby is a very kind of, you say, an elitist event. Yeah. And you think about elitist, that's something that we have often been ostracized from based on access and based on resources. And so when the, when the conversation around, OK, well, how do we make the Kentucky Derby relevant? That's where the history came into play. And we started learning about this history that, you know, of the first 15 jockeys to win the Kentucky Derby, 13 of them look like me. Right. Jeez. Um, we're talking about the late, eight, you know, the 1800s, early 1900s. So we understand the reason why. Wait a minute. Hold on, brother. Neandre. Hold um, on, brother. What? Yeah. The first fifth out of the yeah. first 15 jockeys that won the Kentucky Derby, 13 of those 15 were black. Yes, sir. 13 of the 15 winners were black men. Um, wow. And, and you know, again, as, as we go into this pivotal year, because this is the 150th race of the Derby. And so as we, as we circle back with our partners this year, they were like, you know, we love how you guys talked about that and, draw, and drew more realism to the fact that there is this culture, this connectivity of black America and the Kentucky Derby, no matter how right. you spin it that it's not. And so we really leaned into it this year to really share those stories of these jockeys um, who, who uh, uh, um, uh, were pivotal in making this event a success because of how early on they were able to have that success and really bring this e event and make it a staple event. Um, like I say that now we're celebrating 150 years later uh, with this year's celebration of the Kentucky Derby. Um, with, with our events that we're doing, every one of our events that you go into you see the doc, the jockey story, right? From uh, cutouts of the jockeys uh, of these individual men uh, to share their stories in small snippets to little booklets that we've published that highlight the black jockey story. Our our desire for this is not really to shed light on the Kentucky Derby in itself, 
our desire for this is to showcase more black history that's ingrained in this country that's often overlooked. Let me ask you, what has been the feedback that you've gotten from the Kentucky Derby? Have they been, I mean, we know you, that Black Menswear has this partnership, but was that a difficult partnership to forge or were they like, you know what, finally somebody came in here and kind of held, held us accountable. We welcome you here. What's been the, the energy of the partnership? So, so it's actually been fairly collaborative. And, uh, uh, and I say that because, and, and, and I also say it too, I don't know how often they try to pick up this conversation without having the right partners that can relay the story, right? Um, but what I know is God put us here to have this strategic partnership so that way we are the ones that can help to elevate this, this story around the black jockey. Um, because again, it's, we're, 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 in a, we're in a unique place in history where, you know, there are some states that are trying to, to, to legitimately erase our struggle from history. Um, yeah. But, you know, I look at our struggle as just the means to an end. Where we are today, we couldn't be there without those struggles that we had, but we can't erase those struggles because those give us the motivation uh, they give us the empathy. Uh, they give us the the desire to do bigger and better things. And so we can't eliminate that. So our 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 goal, again, with this is to be able to to share those stories, to shout it from the mountaintops that we are a part of this history uh, in a way that's that without the black jockey experience there to me, I really think that there would be no 150th racing of the Kentucky Derby this May. So will the Kentucky Derby. I'm from Baltimore, brother. So. You know, I'm familiar with those three pivotal yeah. races, right? Uh, Preakness was a major, has always been a major event in Baltimore. Yeah. For the 150 celebration, can we expect some different acknowledgement, something special that the Kentucky Derbies or at the Preakness race that will be done uh, um, that's going to honor these black jockeys? So, so I am not sure what it'll be like once we place our feet in Louisville. I do know right. that there's a lot of energy around uh, showcasing different parts of the history. So I'm, 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 I'm very optimistic that they will not miss this moment. Uh, we will be there. So, so uh, uh, even if they miss the moment, we're not going to, right? Um, so, but we are, we are looking forward to, yeah, we, we are looking forward to being able to, and, and really the, so we're working with the Churchill Downs team out in Louisville, Kentucky uh, for the Kentucky Derby. And they are, you know, they're very leaning into us on speaking through this, having PR press runs while we're in Louisville to speak about our experience and partnering with them throughout the country um, to yeah. highlight these these black jockeys. So they like say if they don't, we will. No, that's dope because it makes me think of this model now. And, and I don't know if this crossed your mind, Brother DeAndre, or not, but it makes me think that maybe in order for us to at least change the conversation or you know, pushing for a more inclusive culture that we need to create organizations like Black Men's Wear to go into certain spaces like, you know, whether it's sports spaces or business yeah. spaces to, to, you know, to say, look, we're willing to partner with y'all. Yeah. We want to, you know, we can, we, we, this is not a confrontational partnership, but this is a partnership where we want to use your resources, your platform, and just to highlight some of the things that Black folks have done to contribute to the rise and growth of this particular event, this particular, yeah. you know, institutional space. And so that's what that's what I'm thinking about, because I don't know if a lot of us and based on what my crew is saying in the chat, people are like 13 out of 15. We yeah. never knew about this. Yeah. So to even so that gives us a sense of pride for us to for those who do enjoy horse racing. And I don't know, you know, we're young brothers. So I don't know if we're going to be hanging out, but I'm sure our grandparents know. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure our, uh, you know, our ancestors, you know, were there. So it's, it gives us a sense of pride. But how do we make sure that it just doesn't come down to being this superficial thing? Because, yeah. like I said, yeah. you sharp as a tack. You clean, brother. And some of us, sometimes we, we, we are so focused on the presentation yeah. versus the actual message. Yes, y'all yeah. are well-dressed black men, but at the end of the day, it's about history, it's yep. about awareness, it's about empowerment. So yep. how do you make sure that that part of the message doesn't get muddled or doesn't get overlooked? And see, that's, and that's, truthfully, that's why they brought us on for this, because if you go and you look at our platform, our platform is all about storytelling and, and being able to capture you in first level with the visual, 
and then capture you in with hearing the words that we're talking about, about community development, community engagement. With these events that we're doing on this national tour with Woodford Reserve, uh, the events is less about doing a um, uh, entertaining party and more about offering a immersive experience to where the individuals that are attending these events, because you know our first event was in LA, second one was in Oakland. We've got an event in Dallas uh, this week. We've got an event in Charlotte next week before we go to Louisville. And all of these uh, footprints that we're building out and we're developing out for these particular events for the Road to the Derby are all focused on putting us in an immersive experience to where we're enjoying learning about the history that we have as a part of this while taking in an elevated, high-class experience with good people, you know what I mean? And and, right. and really being able to network and engage and communicate. But one thing that I learned early on in my, in my past corporate life, uh, when you're building a business and you're building an organization, you're trying to connect with the community, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And really, we're trying to show the value of our organization, Black Men's Wear, caring about our community and then offering different experiences to our community so that we can showcase different uh, uh, opportunities for them to step outside of their comfort zones in some places and be like, oh, OK, it's cool for me to be in these kind of rooms and taking these kind of things because I've seen it and I've experienced it. Uh, and I know I can walk these walk into these hallways. Hey, Brother Neandre, can you can you repeat that? One more time. Oh, that, that, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That was like my, that was one of my sales training one on one things where it's like you can't sell somebody a product before they know that you actually care about who they are as a human human being. And that's what we try to t to relay oh. through our strategic relationships with our brand partners because this derby this derby event this is one of our numerous brand partners that we have that are understanding that we can actually showcase the ROI that comes with community engagement community development. If you actually develop a community of people around what your organization stands for and develop that tie with them, you can have a product that flops, but your community will your community will still be there with you and support you. And so that's what we're trying to that's what we're really trying to embrace with Woodford Reserve. Let us tell this story to where our community feels as though, okay, they're finally honoring who we are. Do we have a long way to go in society? Of course, but we're gonna take our wins along the way, you know. I'm saying, right, we're right, right. I agree. Yeah, and so that's really what we're trying to do is help them develop that community. I agree, brother. You talking now, man? You talking, doctor? You talking? <laughs> uh, Lee Royster Jr. Lee, you said I think highlighting and honoring our contributions in horse racing, Kentucky Derby, is extremely important. I didn't know anything about the facts that were just shared. Absolutely, you said we recently experienced this in women's, co women's collegiate basketball regarding yeah. Caitlin Clark breaking the all-time scoring record. But Pearl Moore is the scoring leader with 4,061 points. Not honored. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And the, I feel like very and I feel like very quickly, brother Ne ne Andre, that we're in a time where, and I was just having a conversation with some folks about this this morning. As much as we are engaged in a lot of foolishness as a people, as a community, and in our culture, I think we're slowly in some cases and aggressively in others getting out of this place because we really do yearn for something that's going to stick with us you know what i'm saying like we can stay with the ratchet stuff and i get it but at the end of the day man a lot of our people are just tired of the ratchetness they want to know who they are where they come from right. what's the history of us in this space and that space right and more importantly we want to see okay we want to have these conversations because we got our children behind us yeah you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and, and, and now, like, when you come up, and come up a certain age, you want to know, like, yo, what am I leaving for my sons, my daughter? Yes. What yes. am I leaving behind them? Because you, 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 can't, leave, you can't leave back just some pretty words. You got to have uh, some history that laid the foundation for their rise and for their empowerment. So what can yes. you speak to that for me, brother? We got about 30 seconds on it. But can you get your thoughts on that? I'll say, man, um, when you look at our platform, the most important thing on our platform that we hit all the time is impact over influence. Because influence, yes, we have a lot of followers on social media, right? So that gives us that influencer status. But what are we doing with that influence? How are we impacting the lives of those that either come into our spaces, come into our environments, or hear our stories, or coming up, coming up behind us? And really leaning into that impact. What am I doing to change the outcomes of those that are around us that's where we're really looking to lean on impact. So I'll just leave it out with that or close it out with saying impact over influence. Don't just have an influence and not do anything with it. 
leverage that influence to impact those that are in your communities that need to see examples of who you are and what you can Ain't do. That's the truth. Ain't that the truth? Impact over influence. I love it. Uh, Stephanie Humphrey channel. You said thanks control room. Amazing segment, brother Faraji. Thank you for bringing brother Neandre on. Absolutely. Uh, my sister Lana, you said the models need to have on the baddest derby attire and hats. We are the flow they want. You want us there? Watch up, watch us show up and take it back over. Come on, Lana. Lana is always oh, oh, I, I can't. for black love and excellence, man. I, I, I was about to say, I can't wait to get there and walk through because they're going to definitely know I'm there. What's my <laughs> feet touch? Oh, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's over there? Yeah, for sure. Hey, look, hey, look, hey, look, Neandre, what, what type of what type of menswear, what type of fashion y'all going to be exhibiting at the, at the, at the, the look, at, you can tell when a black man, he can lay, he, he hold himself like, look, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm about to drop some stuff that y'all ain't never seen, some colors that y'all never thought. And, <laughs> you know, the, the derby is the, it's the safe space to, to, to wear their Easter suit on a day that's not Easter. You know what I mean? Oh, so, come on, brother. Really? Come on now. Come on, you know, the, the, Come the, on, man. The pastel colors, the, the 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 patterns, the I mean, it's it's a day where you can like you know, ain't nothing wrong with peacocking on on Derby Day, and so oh, that's what I'm it really is. excited. I'm really excited to put some put some colors on. I can't I can't tell you exactly what I'm. Gonna you do can't right tell now. me. All right, can't so this, this exactly. is what we going because I know you're gonna put it on your social media. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, Neandre, talk about, uh, give us your social media, give us the social media for Black Men's Wear, because you got a new following me, brother, because I want to no, see y'all, I want to see y'all shop and clean. So, so, so give us the details. Yes, uh, so the, the platform is Black Men's Wear, at Black Men's Wear, uh, our, our website is blackmenswear.com. Uh, my personal page is Mr. M-I-S-T-E-R, Broussard, B-R-O-U-S-S-A-R-D, uh, on Instagram as well. You can find us on LinkedIn as well. Um, but again, we're 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 very excited to connect with more followers to continue to grow this movement that we have uh, because it's it's necessary to feel comfortable in your skin, and that's what we're trying to do. Hey, look, uh, we got another great culture crew member, my brother, uh, Pastor Damon Blissett. He said, "Faraji, tell uh, Neandre to hit GQ Unlimited in Louisville, Kentucky, my okay. old spot." So he wants you to go okay. check that out, GQ Unlimited. Uh, okay. Yeah, man. I'm really excited. Well, look, Brother Neandre, I just want to say thank you so much thank for you. more important just having this conversation. The work that Black Men's Wear is doing to bring awareness to the importance of Black jockeys and at, at the big race of the Kentucky Derby. And more importantly, man, just representing so well for us, man. And I think that a lot of people, my sister Shauna Marsh said, it, people are yearning for substance. It's good to be seen. It's good yeah. to be, uh, to, to have the nice suits on and everything, but it's nothing nothing in comparison to a black man that just not only wears the nice suits but know himself For sure. and has some level of some consciousness and he brings that he shares that he offers that and he redefines that within the culture man oh man brother neandre Thank you so much, brother, for being so good for the culture. Once Thank again, you. give out the website so folks can join you on your national tour. You can find us at blackmenswear.com. Uh, go and, and, and really join the flash mob. Uh, check out the the, uh, the, the spirit of soiree. Uh, but we're, like I said, we're, we love extending, ex expanding our family in every market that we go to. So we can't wait to see some of you guys on the road. There it is right there. My brother, brother Neandre Brossett. And Neandre, you got, like I said, y'all got a new follower in me, man. So I'm, I'm going to jump right on and I'm going to check y'all out. And then uh, I want to see y'all shine on, on, on Derby Day. So I thank you so much, brother, for joining us here on the Culture on the Black Star Network. Keep up the great work. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. All right, folks, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, let's talk about supporting black entrepreneurs in the city of Los Angeles and all across the country. We're going to be checking in with my sister, Kimberly Roth, who serves as the co-founder of Covered Community and how they're doing their part to make sure that fundraising is there. We know that there is a huge, huge disparity uh, in terms of fundraising and business ownership between black owners, black business owners and entrepreneurs and white entrepreneurs. But this one group is doing their part to close the gap a little bit. So we'll have that conversation over on the other side. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. 
This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Man, what a great discussion that we just had with my brother, Neandre Brasso. Make sure y'all check him out at blackmenswear.com. Now, let's switch the conversation as they're talking about history and making sure that we are known in our spaces. We got another challenge that we're facing. We talked about a little bit about this last week as we uh, talk about the disparity in funding and supporting entrepreneurs, particularly black entrepreneurs. Well, there's one organization here in the city of Los Angeles that's doing their part to bridge the gap. They are a nonprofit uh, Los Angeles-based organization by the name of Covered Community, and they're working in partnership with the University of Southern California to award $3 million to provide entrepreneurial training to underserved entrepreneurs in the state of California, particularly here in Los Angeles. And joining me now is the co-founder of Covered Community, Kimberly Rolfe. Kimberly, thank you so much for joining me. How are you this afternoon? Thank you so much for having me. I am doing well and definitely excited to be here to have this conversation with you. Absolutely, I'm, and I'm truly, truly excited to have you here. Kimberly, talk to us a little bit about uh, this, this organization, Covered Community. What is this all about? So Covered Community was founded in 2015, and the goal was to improve the health and the wealth of the community. And ultimately, we founded from Covered Community what we call the Southern California Virtual Business Center, which our goal was simply to improve the financial position of the communities that we serve. And this was so important in terms of um, make an impact within the African American community because one of the things that we began to understand is we really make a difference and we really make an impact in our community when we start our own businesses. And being an entrepreneur since I was 13 years old, um, I understood, you know, how um, important it is to have businesses in our community that can hire people within our community um, that. These, you know, and ultimately create jobs, jobs that create careers, careers that ultimately give people an opportunity to become homeowners and own their own communities. So for us, this was this work was really important. This is very important. And there's a lot of conversation right now, Kimberly, as you know, around fundraising, around supporting black entrepreneurs, particularly black women who are in the space as entrepreneurs. What first and foremost, as you see this ongoing battle. Um, as you see that there are people who are people and forces that are against the rise of black entrepreneurs. What do you uh, what do you see happening over the next three to five years? Is the landscape going to be more welcoming to black entrepreneurs or are we going to expect to should we expect to see more challenges? I think that at the end of the day, we just have to make our own mark and we have to pave our own way. I would love to be able to say, oh yes, it's going to be great for us. But we know, you know, what what history has, you know, already told us that it's never an easy plight for us when it comes to starting our own businesses, raising the capital that we need for our businesses, um, and really getting out there and excelling our and growing our businesses to the level that we need to. So you know, I say, you know, it's it's just important for us to get out there, be strategic, um, pave our own path so that at the end of the day, we don't have to worry about who's doing what. Because if during a time, you know, when CJ, Madam CJ Walker started her business, if she could create a thriving business, I know we can create thriving businesses today. And that's what we're ultimately out here doing. So, you know, I think what it comes down to is, you know, what's our strategy? How do we move forward? How do we ensure that we create the kinds of businesses that we need in our community? And then how do we get the support and the backing behind those businesses? As you know, you know, when you first launch a business, nobody really believes in it, you know, right, the, right, the support right. is not there, the resources aren't there, but 
when you put in enough work and you really pursue that business and build it uh, strategically and you start making an impact, that's when people begin to notice and that's when people begin to get on board with what you're doing. So that's what we're focused on. We're focused on teaching our entrepreneurs how to scale and grow businesses. Our focus primarily is we teach them how to do that using corporate and government contracts because yeah. one of the things that we've learned is corporate and government contracts is the fastest way to gener to grow a business to a million dollars. Well, let me, and I'm glad that you brought that up because uh, last week we talked about it on a show, uh, Kimberly, where we just we talked about that historic decision that was made last month uh, with the uh, situation around the Minority Business Development Agency and how the, uh, the the judge in the state of Texas said that essentially that this particular agency that was set up and designed to provide funding and resources and other um, needs. To, to minority business owners were discriminating against white business owners and ruled that, you know what, this agency needs to open the doors to white business owners. So when we're making, when those type of decisions are being made and the work that you're doing at Covered Community, how, you know, how do you make sense of it all? How do you challenge that? So this is my thoughts right out the gate. I always ask the question whenever I'm in front of an audience or I'm speaking to people, when did diversity not, uh, when did diversity exclude people? I always thought diversity was an opportunity to give everyone a seat at the table. So when we start talking about diversity is a way to exclude different groups, I just don't subscribe to that. And I think that the approach and the mindset that we have to take is recognizing that we're going to fight and we're going to push for diversity so that we continue as business owners to have a seat at the table. But it was never the intention of diversity, equity, inclusion, or any of those type programs to exclude any, anyone. So what I say to, you know, that <laughs> the ruling that occurred, you know, I just think that it's just another way, you know, to take, shift the focus from what's um, really, you know, the key issue is, and that's making sure that everyone has a seat at the table. And so that's what we're focused on. And so when people start saying, well, it excludes this group or that group, that's just simply not true. Well, yeah, it's not true, but you know, and I think it's interesting because it, 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 it forces us to become more creative as, mm -hmm. as a group of people where we have to figure out well, like a new pathway. And you mentioned, you mentioned this, and I think this is, I think you're right on point that government and other institutions, quasi-government institutions like the Minority Business Development Agency, um, how these institutions have paved the way. But now I feel my great concern, Kimberly, is that now that government is in an uncertain place, we are seeing more in each and every day that government cannot handle the growing needs of, the, of a more diverse group of citizens in this country every group of people want to be seen and heard and supported and all of those things. So now black folks who I believe was the foundation of this country, we are at a, a crossroads in trying to figure out what's the best course of, to take because the conversation now has shifted from black people, black business owners to, okay, let's support minority business owners. Let's support LG business owners from the LGBTQ community. Uh, uh, and when I say minority, more women business owners, right? You mm -hmm. might you have a growing number of Asian Americans that are in business. You have a growing American, a number of uh, legal immigrants who come across the waters, get their papers, and set up business. And so it makes us, as Black folks, we're back in the same place again, where everyone else has become everyone else becomes a priority, and our pain and our struggle and our success is once again placed on a back burner. What's your take on that? I think I'm no less frustrated than anyone else. I feel like, you know, as you stated earlier, you know, we paved the way for a lot of things that have happened in this country. And I see, you know, a lot of groups standing on our shoulders and ult ultimately reaping the benefits. But my mindset Come on, is, say it. Come on now, Kimberly. You're about to take me to church. <laughs> but my mindset is, is either I can focus on, you know, the things that people are telling me we can't have, or I can figure out how to go and get what is rightfully ours. And to me, the way that we do that is we just go aggressive about taking care of our business. You know, we were taught growing up that we had to be the best. 
We had to be the ones who went the extra mile. We had to be the ones who were exceptional. And I think it's concepts like that, that our parents gave us and taught us. I don't think any of that's changed. I don't think that's any of that has changed with the new legislation, with the um, the push to you know support every group, except seems like at times the African Americans. But what I do think it does is it reminds us of what our position is and how far how how hard we have to work to um, ensure that we make uh, an impact um, not only in our own personal families but in our communities, and so that we ultimately leave a legacy and an inheritance in our own communities. Yeah. And we're going to do that by just putting in the work. Like Absolutely. I said, if, if Madam C.J. Walker could do it during her time, we could definitely do it during our times. Look, we got to take a quick pause. But Kimberly, when we come back, I want to get back to some of the work that you guys are doing as you partner with USC and some other institutions and organizations and agencies. Folks, we are going to continue to talk about supporting Black entrepreneurs in the city of Los Angeles and in the state of California on the other side. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. We've been checking in with my sister, Kimberly Rolfe, who serves as the director of the co-founder of the L.A.-based nonprofit organization, Covered Community, where they're working in partnership with the University of Southern California, USC, and has been awarded $3 million to provide entrepreneurial training to underserved entrepreneurs here in the state of California. And um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about this, this effort, this readiness program, $3 million. It's a lot to an individual and, and, and to businesses that need it. And so I'm wondering like, how is this, how is this program going to roll out? How is it going to, touch some of the, the the black entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs in the state of California, Kimberly? Well, this is a program that we are used to doing. And, you know, I know a lot of times, you know, when business owners hear, oh my goodness, there's another program, you know, they get a little apprehensive thinking, um, I just don't want to go through another program that at the end of the day just does not yield the type of results that I'm I'm looking for. But our program is very different. I tell it, I've told every entrepreneur and I tell um, every person I speak to, our program is second to none. Our program is called um, Capacity. And with that capacity training, what we do ultimately is we work with small businesses to secure corporate and government contracts. So what does that mean? Well, this year we are on a mission. We are on a mission to lead an entire community of small businesses on a journey to secure million dollar contracts. And so you might say to me, well, Kimberly, well, how are you going to do that? Well, first and foremost, while I am one of the co-founders of Covered Community, the, the other side to that is uh, many years ago, um, not only did, did I work, on, have I always worked under contracts, but I secured my first million dollar contract. And as I secured my first million dollar contract, I began to teach other small businesses exactly what they needed to do in order to get there. So I could take them step by step. And a matter of fact, not only did I teach it in a class, but I eventually wrote a book called Capacity, the Roadmap to Secure Corporate and Government Contracts. And thus far, we've helped small businesses secure nearly $500 million in contracts. Wow. Tell me what other organization can say that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> $500 million. $500 million in contracts. We are and not you, playing. You, <laughs> no, not at all. Here's the thing, though. And this is something that I, I read because we were talking about this issue uh, just a little bit uh, last week. But I, I read that you know, one that a lot of these 
of black business or a lot of um, you know black owned business ran by black women. Um, also, that there is a, a high number of black a high number of employees that black these black businesses and these entrepreneurial efforts have um, have employed. So I'm I'm wondering in terms of that level of impact. What kind of impact will that have on the California state revenue or, or you know, what kind of impact will that have on a, a city like Los Angeles where you have, a, and this and I know this might be surprising to some folks, but L.A. is only composed of 8 to 9% black people. Back mm -hmm. in the day, there were a lot more, but now there are a lot less. Mm -hmm. And I even also read, Kimberly, uh, from Afro LA News, where they talked about one in ten black person that comes into LA is now becoming where the black immigrant uh, community of Los Angeles is growing exponentially year after year. Mm -hmm. So, how does that all play into empowering these type of programs with these efforts? How will they empower these communities to revi really revitalize the black community and entrepreneurs entrepreneurs uh, here in LA? Well, as you know, um, L.A. is a very expensive place to live. You don't <laughs> say, man. L.A., boy. You're going to pay for this sunshine. <laughs> right. <laughs> and because it's such an expensive place to live, um, it's, get, it's gotten to the point where, you know, you've got a lot of African-Americans who have just moved out of the city and seek uh, places, obviously, that are more affordable. Um, to live because maybe they don't want to go to work and um, every dollar um, uh, they have to just uh, spend on just the cost of living. Um, so it's getting to the point that um, LA is a place where you can't just live here with a job. Most people um, have some sort of side gig or those who are really thriving have a business. So it's really um, getting to the point where it's a place where you need your own business or you need some sort of significant side gig in order to really be able to survive um, where we live. So when you talk about impact, the impact that it makes is huge because when I can take you from, you know, let's say like the reentry population, um, I can take you from maybe being you know, in a situation where you had no control over your life and now starting a business, rebuilding your life and getting to the point where you're completely financially um, sustained and as well as um, eventually independent. Well, that changes everything. That's a game changer. It's not only a game changer for you, but it's a game changer for your family. I like to think about one business owner that we worked with who went through our program as a 60 year old woman who was um, who had been in business nearly um 20 years in janitorial services. She talked about how she had just gotten her GED and she complained all the way through my program. Within four months um, of going through our program, we had taught her how to pitch. She pitched for a $5 million contract. So wow. we won it. Wow. And so now, so within four months? Uh -huh, within four months. And now she does is sing our praises <laughs> because she said, Kimberly, I complained because I barely got my GED and your program was like doing a, a master's in contracting. I said, but if you stick with us, we're going to teach you what you need to know in order to take your business to a whole nother level. I'm not in this to just, you know, have a program. I win contracts. I still win contracts. But if I can make an impact and a difference in my community, if I can begin to show other business owners how you too can change not only the trajectory of your family, but your community, you know, yes. that's what we're looking to do. That's what we're aiming for. And that's why our program is so impactful and it has results that are unusual. And, and, and you know, I love to hear stories like that. And I'm, I'm glad that that's being done. I, I want to get a sense of from you, Kimberly, we have been talking about, the power, the value of black businesses for years, right? Yes. Especially, I would say, especially since Obama has been in office, right? Mm -hmm. We've been talking about this for some time. But now we, we, we have, when you look at the numbers, we know that black businesses, they, you know, y'all have made a mark, entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs particularly have made a mark on the industry, on the marketplace and all of that good stuff. But how do we make sure, how do we create businesses that are going to lead to the liberation of black people in mm -hmm. other areas, right? Where it's not just about bringing in money for profit, but it's about bringing in money to, that we can start to use to invest in other things, maybe 
you know, a for-profit business can help to fund a non-profit business mm -hmm. that can help to fund a community initiative and that in, in creating a, a, a pipeline of support for the community, right? It's mm -hmm. good that we do have black businesses in the community, but I'm from Baltimore, <laughs> live out in LA. Mm -hmm. So we, we can have the, the food spot, the little clothing retail spot, we might have uh, the incense spot, you know, like we got down in Lamert Park, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like we might yeah. have all of these different things, right? But they're only, they're, even though they're nice when you're walking down through the neighborhood, through the, yeah. you know, through our neck of the woods, but I'm talking about operating at such a large level that now these businesses are the primary funders mm -hmm. of the, the projects that we want to use, whether it's for community beautification, educational pro uh, educational programs for our children liberation programs however we want to call it but how do we get to that place because um, we're running we're bringing money in and mm -hmm. we're money is coming out of our community each and every day yes. but what's not staying in our community mm -hmm. is the changing of culture new institutions that will help to empower the community and I want to know, yeah, we, we, I think we've mastered setting up businesses and running businesses, but how can we use businesses to serve as the foundation of a different reality in our community? I love this question. And the reason I love this question, because um, it's important for us, as you, as you stated, we can't just create businesses that support ourselves. We have to build businesses that grow beyond us. We have to grow business, create businesses that are bigger than us that have impacts that are beyond us. And the way we do that is we work to create businesses that are scalable. What does that mean exactly? It's creating businesses that ultimately at some point take on a life of their own and that can operate without us. That means businesses that have systems that can continue to scale and grow so that it's just not in Lamert Park, but you're actually starting a business that can be in every city throughout um, right. this, this state and this country. And that's one of the reasons why we partnered with University of Southern California. I was actually a professor at USC in the Marshall School of Business when I developed this program. I wow. owned, okay. owned my own accounting firm at the time. And one of the things that I began to teach and share with students about was about scaling a business. Because a scaling a business is not just simply opening the local retail store and saying, "Hey, you know, let me see how many clothing items I can I can schedule. I can, right, I can, right. I can sell." It's about figuring out how do I create this clothing store on a national and an international level, so that not only am I, you know, in business, you know, this to support myself, but I'm creating a business that is nationally and internationally known and mm -hmm. that grows to the point where we have to hire people from almost every city we work in or wherever we have warehouses, et cetera. So we're taking that model and essentially training our businesses so that they actually have the capacity um, to be able to create businesses that are so much bigger and so much grander than just the little mom and pops. So being able to utilize, for instance, some of our USC resources, professors, experts who actually know business um, is really what's becoming a game changer for yeah. a lot of the businesses that go through our program. This sounds like a phenomenal opportunity. It sounds like a phenomenal opportunity. It's exciting. And we don't have to <laughs> say it again, Kevin. It's exceptional. <laughs> it's exceptional. You're like, no, both phenomenal for Rodney. It's exceptional. I got it's exceptional. Uh, but you know what? And we don't have the time today, but, uh, you know, I think that we need to have a different conversation about our view of our own businesses, right? Mm -hmm. And I go, and I know, we, you know, we there's stuff that's been on social media, like what do you expect from a black business versus what you expect from a white-owned business and all of those things. But I'm saying that there needs to be a cultural shift Mm -hmm. And I was thinking first around this idea, because it's one thing to just, like you said, to have a business to just to, and for profit and just to support yourself and family. It's That's another cool. thing when that business, like in Baltimore, there were there were businesses. There was a restaurant called Terra Cafe. Of course, they sold food mm -hmm. and it was a restaurant. But then at the same time, it became this community space. Oh, wow. right. Where those things where events would take place, whether you talk about something that's more lighthearted like a poetry slam to more 
heavy stuff where there was like social justice organizational mm-hmm. meetings and things, right? And and I know that for our community, I can't speak about anybody else's community, but for our community, we need those type of spaces and businesses, and they need to be supported. They need to be supported on a daily basis because mm-hmm. we love being in somebody in in our own space. Yes, I love it. I love yeah, it. Absolutely. But if, if 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 you look at your average black business, they're probably mm-hmm. they're not packed every day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? They get a couple of walk ins here and there. We get great conversation, but you can't you can't run no business off of great conversations and. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's absolutely. You're you know absolutely I mean? right. Conscious talk. You can't run no business off of that. You're absolutely right, and I think you make so many great points. You know, keep in mind that oftentimes African Americans will start service-based businesses, food-based businesses because right. they're a lower barrier of entry. Um, so it's easier for us to access those businesses. And right. I recognize that. And I recognize oftentimes, you know, those tend to be the hub of our community. But I think where our focus is, we're, we're looking to build million dollar enterprises with our community, because at, at the end of the day, you all, we all know that <laughs> there's one thing that, that speaks louder than any words, and that's the power of the dollar. Yep. So the more we can create enterprises that um, impact our community, that employ our communities, that support yeah. our communities, that's where we're going to make the biggest difference. No, that's, that's I, agree, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And for us to look back, you talking about history, and as we wrap up, talk about history, those businesses in the back in the day, they understood their role. Their role yeah. was not just to get, just yeah. to get money, mm-hmm. but those businesses was an outgrowth of our own understanding of where we are supposed to go. They knew that they were just a small link in the chain. Absolutely. That the business was a part of the liberation struggle. The business mm-hmm. was a part of the fight for freedom, justice, and equality. The business was a part of economic empowerment and growth and development. So they understood that, right? And I think we can go back to those lessons, go back to looking at those businesses and say, you know what? Let's let's generate a culture around that. Uh, Kimberly, mm-hmm. this has been fantastic to have the conversation. How can people learn more about this opportunity? They can go to scvirtualbusinesscenter.com. Like, like, think of it like Southern California, scvirtualbusinesscenter.com. It talks about all of our different programs. We have a cohort that is starting, um, you guys, in a week. So definitely go on our website, register. Um, again, we're leading an entire community of small businesses on a journey to become million-dollar suppliers. If you, this is something you think you want to do, go ahead and join us. You can go to CoveredCommunity.com. It's also going to get you to our Southern California Virtual Business Center, where we are doing all of the training. And again, I'm looking for businesses that want to make an impact in our community by becoming million-dollar suppliers, million-dollar million dollar, million dollar enterprises that ultimately employ and support our communities. There it is right there. Kimberly Roth, who serves as the co-founder of Covered Community, doing some fantastic work with USC and other organizations and institutions. Kimberly, thank you so much for being with me today and having this conversation and essentially being so good for the culture. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us. I thank each and every one of you. Big shout out to you as the online culture crew. I cannot thank you enough. I see you. I see you, Lana. Lana, you always showing us love and so much support. And I thank you so much. Lee Royce, I see you. Sean, I see you. Who else we got? Pastor Damon Bassett. I see you. Cindy D, Ming Lee, all of y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoy the content, make sure you go to our website today at theblackstarnetwork.com. Download the app for free. Follow us on social media at Black Star Network. And we ask you to give the investors, supporters, stakeholders in this process We are bringing Black content, having these conversations like no other place on the digital space. So we need your support. So go to our website today at blackstarnetwork.com. Also, make sure y'all follow me on social media at The Real Faraji on IG, at Faraji on the X platform, and at Faraji Muhammad on uh, Facebook. I would love to connect with you and continue to build community with you as we are doing our part here on air. Look, stay tuned up next at 6 p.m. Is Roland Martin Unfiltered. As always, never be afraid to challenge what's wrong. Stand for what's right while being yourself in the process. God willing, we will talk tomorrow for another exciting edition of The Culture right here, only here, exclusively here on the Black Star Network. Talk to you soon. Have a great evening. Peace.
everyone and welcome to A Balanced Life here at Black Star Network. And each and every week we're bringing you tips and tools to put in your balanced living toolkit. As you know, we're talking this time about being an entrepreneur, how to handle the great resignation, and of course, what it means to live your dream. Now, hey, look, I'm just going to say it. We've all been in that space where we've had a really good side hustle. But now we're in that space of turning that into legitimate businesses. And a part of being able to turn your side hustle into a legitimate business is being able to understand all the nuances of not only what it means to run a business, but how to keep your head on straight. All right, hear me well now. How do you keep your head on straight when you're trying to run your own shop? Whatever shingle that you've hung out, whatever business plan that you have, whatever website you're trying to develop, social media platform, there are a whole host of ways and opportunities for you to begin to thrive in the thing that is your passion that you choose to pursue. Today, we're going to be joined by some amazing people. We have our contributors today, Stacey Owens, who is an author, educator, and charter school owner. We have with us today, Dr. Tierney, who is our level up coach and author. And we're also gonna have some special one-on-one -on -one time today with Art and Sheldana Robinson. They are the owner of Sheldy's Beauty Salon. And let me tell you, industry is everything. Hey, everybody, welcome in. Hello. Hello. Hey, I am so excited that you all are here today because we hear and see a lot of people trying to figure out how to navigate if they have the wherewithal to be an entrepreneur. And as we know, it is not an easy space. Everyone here today is running their own business. We've been doing it for quite some time and we believe we have something of value to offer. I'm going to start with Dr. Tierney to talk to us for a moment about how do you get your mind right to start <laughs> living your dream? Because we know it's a process, Dr. T. Uh, um, commit to the process, first and foremost, <laughs> and know that it's a process. Do not think that this is going to be something that you're just going to do overnight. I know it might feel like you woke up one morning and said, I'm going to start my own business. But really, like wrapping your mind around that thing, it takes some time. You know, I was actually just having a conversation with a good friend of mine who made the transition to be an entrepreneur. And I told her one of the biggest uh, mental hurdles that you have to make is switching from a W-2 brain to a CEO brain. And what I mean by that is when you are in a W-2 space, you're looking um, to your supervisor, your team, your management team, or whoever that may be for kind of the directive of where the company is going. When you're the CEO, you're the one that's outlining the direction that you're going and what you want your company to do and be and to grow into. And so once you kind of start making that mental switch there, then it unlocks more of your creativity. It unlocks um, more of the opportunities that you're able to see around you. Even in the face of different adversities, you'll be better able to see the opportunities. Whereas when you're in the W-2 kind of brain, it's like, oh, well, this isn't going to work. So let me go and find me another W-2 um, so that I can like not have to deal with all of this. So again, the biggest piece is just understanding that it is a process. It's something that happens over time and it's something that you continually learn. And I'm going to go ahead and on a limb here and say, every one of us that's on this show today, we're still in that process. We're still learning. It's still different things that, that are unlocking no matter how long you are in business. It is truly a process. Let me ask you a follow up question, because oftentimes there's a difference between being in the right head space and becoming a head case. How do we avoid some of those pitfalls of becoming a head case in the process of living the dream? Absolutely. Um, get the right people around you. Basically, we're all going to have moments where we are a head case like, you know, um, for about two weeks. Prior, I was a bit of a head case, <laughs> but when you have the right people around you that can help you see what you can't see, that can literally look you in the face and say, OK, sugar, you're being a bit of a head case now. Like, come on, it's, it's OK. And, you know, can help you just really navigate that thing. That's what really keeps you from getting stuck in that head space that ultimately will will um, ruin your dreams and cause you to dismantle some things. It's not that we won't ever be in that space. We're all going to be in that space where we feel like, oh my gosh, the sky is falling and you know, anxiousness, some depression, all of that is going to happen on this entrepreneurship journey. So if you feel that, don't think that something's wrong. That's kind of par for the course. The goal is to not get stuck there. And the way to not get stuck there is making sure you have the right people around you, be that you know, friends, family, be that your coaches, business coaches, be that other like-minded business owners that can walk this journey with you. 
Absolutely. Stacy. let me ask you this question because you're in that space. Some of us are solopreneurs. It's just us running our company and we may, you know, contract people from time to time. But you are an employee based business and you actually employ people. How is living the dream for you in this time of doing this and all the other things related to running your school? <laughs> yeah, you know. When you're taking that hobby and you're turning it into that reality and you have that type of reality that involves employing other people, you're now carrying your weight and their weight, too. So you, you do have to have a commitment like Dr. Tyranny was talking about. And I think you also have to have a sense of determination. You have to be determined that you're going to learn those hard lessons, that you're going to be able to not only help yourself, but also be able to operate in that space where you can provide assistance to others because now I'm dependent on others to become part of my dream. So every one of my employees out there, you know, I tell you first when I onboard you to, to start working here at the school, the first thing I say is here's my legacy. Here's, here's, here's my vision, my dream. Here's what uh, my end result will look like in terms of what it looks like in my head. And then I start helping them to see how can you become part of that legacy? How can you become part of that vision? Because now they have to buy into it. They have to buy into the fact that they're going to put aside while they're here in that employee status. They're putting aside maybe some of their hopes and dreams. And they're starting to work with you alongside with you to bring yours to reality. And I think that's the hardest thing is finding those right people that mm -hmm. understand the legacy building of somebody else's dream. And then they are willing participants of wanting to bring someone else's vision to life. If you find those right people, then it works like magic. Mm, working like magic isn't always easy. What are some of the qualities that you look for, Stacey, in people who you believe can be legacy builders alongside you? See, now that's going to depend on what your legacy is and what you're doing. See, for me, my legacy is children. So I'm looking for somebody who's passionate. You care. Do you even like kids, first of all? Because if you don't, you'll be in here being a kid killer. And we can't, we can't accept that. So we want to make sure that you're passionate about what you're doing. You have compassion for others. You're able to come in and, and be diverse, see the world through other lenses and not just your lens, because now you are about to become a cup that's going to pour into the babies that I have floating around here in the school. And I want to make sure that you're going to give a good, clean pour and not come in here and be toxic for them. Mm, now, you said a mouthful right there, because oftentimes, depending on your industry, there are different things that you need in order to be able to do the work that you're trying to accomplish. I want to invite in Art and Sheldana just to say hey to the people and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. And then when we come back in our second block, I want to have some one on time, one on one time with these good people. Hey, Art and Sheldana. Hello, Hi, Dr. Jackie. How are you? I am well. Thank you so much for joining us. So tell the world what industry you're in, who you are and what you do. Uh, well, I'm uh, Art Robinson. This is my wife, Sheldana, and we're the owners of uh, Sheldy's Beauty Salon in Sterling, Virginia. And uh, we've been in business now about, uh, we're in our 28th year in business. And um, we do the, the full gamut of, uh, of hair services. And um, yeah, uh, that's what we do. We also uh, retail uh, human hair extensions and lace wigs as well. So so you just described for me what a lot of people who come into your industry wish they could do, which is expand and explore their options. Being in business 28 years, when did you decide to go from just doing hair to also offering product? Because there's a part of the industry that's service, and then there's a part of the industry that is product and business. How does that happen? Well, well, for me, it was really sort of an epiphany you know, once I uh, determined, uh, to be honest with you, the, the profit margin in uh, in selling things like extensions and lace wigs, we were we were buying those things already. Um, you know, from other from other outlets, and then once we, uh, you know, started to recognize that, hey, you know, we could if we could get a uh, a high quality, stable uh, product line that we could import. Um, that you know, we could really you know change the game, uh, you know, for our business, you know, and for us personally. So, what does that look like in terms? So, who went to beauty school, Sheldana or Art? <laughs> Trust <laughs> I me, I don't know anything about beauty. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm the complete business side, and, right. and, and Sheldana, Sheldana is totally operations. Totally operations. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, yes. so yeah. 
So those are two different sides of the business. When we come back after the break, I want to unpack that for a moment because many of you are out there. You may be in beauty school, hair school, barber school. You may be trying to figure out what it is you want to do with your creative passion. But oftentimes it's important to understand the operational side and the business side of your business. We'll be back in a moment after the break. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Welcome back, everyone, to A Balanced Life. And as you can tell, if you're deciding to open up your own shop, you got to bring your passion. You've got to bring your creativity. You have to have a sense of business and you need to have people around you who can keep you well balanced as well as well rounded. We're having this conversation today with Art and Sheldonna Robinson of Sheldee's Beauty Salon. Let's bring them back in because they mentioned something at the last block that was interesting about the operational side and the business side. So I'm going to ask Sheldonna this this particular question because you all have a variety of people in your shop who do more than just little kids and people with gray hair and all of those things. So how do you decide who to hire for the kind of business you're running? Well, we run like we do um, all types of hair. Mm -hmm. So whether it's weaving or braiding or natural hair or relaxed hair, we do it all. So a lot of the girls, they what they we always tell people to stick to their lane. Like some of them just like doing braiding. They don't like to get into, you know, doing weaving or natural hair or anything else. So we always tell them to stick to their lane. So we always look for someone that for braiders, you know, some girls just like to braid. Then we have girls that just like to do weaves. They prefer to do weaves. Then we have ones that like to do, you know, the, the just natural hair without adding hair to it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a wide, you know, it's pretty wide. And we just look for people that, you know, what their passion is. Because everybody's passion is not like I don't do weaving. Because I don't like to sew. So I um I mostly stick to natural hair. So we always figure out, you know, what's their passion to do because it's when you like to do something, you're gonna love it and you're gonna continue to do it. I think that makes perfectly good sense because oftentimes people get offended when you say things like stay in your lane. But the reality in business is if you're not in your lane, as Art said, you can't find that profit margin. So Art, what does that look like when you think of diversifying? At some point you went from doing maybe one type of hair to moving into other lanes of hair care. How does an individual in your industry decide when it's time to expand? Well, you know, for us, in terms of the types of hair that we do, that was really sort of predicated on the staff that we got. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you know, we brought in more and more people, d uh, different ones uh, had proficiency in different areas. And so that's how we expanded our um uh, uh, the, the services that we provide. But in terms of, you know, the, the wigs and the extensions and importing that and the products, that's really just um, just a recognition that we could, you know, we, that we could really sort of cut out the middleman and, you know, go direct and, uh, you know, you know, get those items and sell them and, 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 and increase our profitability. So I'm going to ask the question from a consumer perspective, because I know our audience is watching. Oftentimes people don't know where to go and who is right for them. Can either of you share how a client can select the stylist that's best for them? I think it depends on what they want. A lot of times we on the phone, we try to a lot of times it's best to come in for a consult, you know, but a lot of times, you know, at the front desk, we tell them to try to figure out, especially with someone new. Or on the phone, we tell them, you know, what do you want? What are you looking for? Because if you're looking for a natural hair stylist, that's what we're going to give you, a natural hair stylist. If you're interested in relaxers or your hair is breaking or something like that, then we're going to give you a stylist that deals with that. So we try to make sure that we get more, a lot of information on the telephone first. And if we don't get, if we can't get enough, we ask them to come in for a consult so we can actually talk to them. So 
this type of consult that you do, it really does help the consumer or your future client determine what it is they want. I want to bring Stacy and Dr. Tierney into the conversation because over the course of time that I've known them, all of us have changed our hairdo. <laughs> we have gone from one thing to another. And Shaldana and Art bring up a really good point. Oftentimes we decide the hair we want to wear based on the outfit we're wearing. Um, when we think about going to a concert, the first thing we say is, what are we going to do with our hair? How is it, ladies, that you make decisions about what to do with your hair, whether you're transitioning in from a relaxer or out of a relaxer to a natural hairstyle? Stacy, you're wearing your locks. How do you make these levels of determination? I made my determination based off of um, I was going to the stylist once a week at one time in my life. And um, my schedule just became very busy. And for some people, when you go to the hair salon, that's a, a self-care moment for you and you're relaxing and you're enjoying that time. And for me, it was anxiety and stress because I wanted to get in and get out. And so I knew I needed to do something different. So I went to um, a natural state. And then I was like, oh, wait, this is tougher than I thought. I was, I don't know if I want to do this either. And so that's how I ended up in the sister lot world. I was like, let me lock this up so that I can become a plant and just spray it with some water and <laughs> just keep moving. And so, and I don't have to see anyone for about six weeks to get it retied. And, and I wasn't that <laughs> quick too. So that's how I got to the locks. And the whole blue thing that became my brand, you know, um, I, I, I decided I wanted to be as blue as possible because um, I, I came across an opportunity where someone tried to determine that the way that our hairstyle or the way that our hair grow out of our heads should determine what we should be able to do in certain business worlds or it should determine how smart we are and it should determine whatever. So my blue hair became a brand for the school because I wanted to show kids that it's what's in your head and not on your head that makes a difference. And I can run a school, I can sit in any boardrooms, I can run the gamut with anybody, right, with this blue hair. So now I'm sort of stuck with it because the kids now look at is, is what I learned and what I put in my mind that's going to make me be great in terms of bringing our dreams together. So that's sort of how I became the blue head law lady. <laughs> I love the story because individuality is such a very big component of who we are. And as women, certainly how we wear our hair and what we do. And I, I, you know, I'm in the salon a lot. So I noticed that men, too, are also getting, you know, their hair done. And it's a very big part of who we are and what we do. Dr. Tierney, what's your hair journey? <laughs> Oh, um, <laughs> well, so I was very much in the higher education kind of corporate space. So for years, I prescribed to the your hair has to be a certain way and a certain, you know, exactly what Stacy was saying to exude my level of intelligence and to be accepted and da 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 da. And so I actually grew my hair out and I wore so worth so in for, you know, several years. And I liked it that way. I liked, you know, wearing my hair that way. And then all of a sudden when I just got kicked off of the corporate hem hamster wheel and became the reluctant entrepreneur, I realized that there's so much more that I could do, you know, with my hair, with the color of my nails. And because there was no one to tell me that I that I couldn't. And so it's like I had this grand awakening and I decided that when I turned 40, I wanted to cut my hair back off. And so I researched for about a year found an amazing stylist and I looked at, you know, his clients because the the main thing for me was just the health of my hair. I wanted to make sure that my hair, my natural hair was healthy, you know, and continue to stay healthy and went for a consultation and said, OK, when I come back, we're chopping it off. And so that's exactly what I did, chopped it off and it's all gone all up under here. It's all gone. And I have not loved it any more than I thought that I could. Like, I absolutely love my hair short. I love my hair long. I love everything about it because it's me. You know, it's a, it's a reflection and an extension of who I am. And like Stacy said, it's not about what's on my head. It's what's in my head that matters. And what was important to me was to have a stylist that understood me that that's one less thing that I have to worry about. So when I go sit in Dorica's chair, he pretty much tells me what we're going to do. He was the one that said, OK, we're tired of the brown. Let's, you know, start going blonde. And I was like, oh, OK, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah. And, and so that's what we did. And now he's told me that I'm transitioning to natural. So that was never on my radar because I didn't want to deal with 
all the things. But yeah, now she's transitioning to natural. It'll still be short and still be sassy and still be fierce, but it'll be natural. So I have no idea what's next, what the next color is, what the next length is, because I've just kind of turned that over to my stylist who I trust and who knows me, knows my style, knows what looks good. And that's one less thing that I have to worry about. And so, yeah, we don't know where, I don't, I, I don't know where my hair is going to, you know, going to end up, but wherever it ends up, I know that it'll be amazing and wonderful because I'm more concerned with, like Stacey said, what's in my head and what's in my heart than what's on my head. I think that that makes a lot of sense. I want to invite Art and Sheldana back in for a moment because this conversation, you know, you guys have sort of turned that corner to social entrepreneurship. And for most of our audience, they've been with us long enough to know that individuals who do social entrepreneurship, individuals who bring a message to the work that they do. Art and Sheldana, not too long ago, Yamish Alcindor came to visit you and you all did a PBS special and you talked a lot about the value of hair and self-esteem and the Crown Act. When we talk to our clients who are in the corporate setting, most of the conversations are along the lines of, I'm in a predominantly non-black environment, so I can't go in looking like my hair is not being taken care of. Because there seems to be that assumption of that bias that if you have natural hair, you're not taking care of it. How did you turn that corner to decide to make a social message become a part of your brand and your business? Well, I mean, um just like the other young ladies were saying that uh, it's really more about what's inside your head than what's on top of your head. And um, we we really just wanna be a place, we don't, we don't judge anybody based on what hairstyle they want. If you wanna be natural, you can be natural. If you wanna be relaxed, you can be relaxed. If you wanna put a weave in, wear a wig. I mean, we're here to do whatever it is that you, know, that, that, that you wanna do. But we just wanted to, that piece on PBS essentially was about how, <clears throat> about how the state of Connecticut had joined a bunch of other states in making it illegal to discriminate against someone based on um, you know how they wore their hair. So, uh, but you know we're we're really neutral. You know what I mean? We're not uh, we're pro everything. We're pro you know how you know whatever it is. If you like it, we love it, and we'd like to be able to provide it for you. I think that that's an important message for people to hear. We often have stereotypes in communities of color related to how you wear your hair, whether you wear it curly or you jump out the shower and you just wear it wet, or if you lock it up, you know, twist it up, do whatever that it is. There are often times that we are out of balance as a people because there's so many stereotypes. I'm going to jump ahead and go into it. When we come back after the break, I want to unpack that for a moment because many of you are out there. You may be in beauty school, hair school, barber school. You may be trying to figure out what it is you want to do with your creative passion. But oftentimes it's important to understand the operational side and the business side of your business. We'll be back in a moment after the break. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Welcome back, everyone, to A Balanced Life. And in this moment, we're at that stage where we're going to talk to you about how do you really unpackage your business plan? How do you make your dream a reality? How do you live this thing that has been in your heart for so long while at the same time learning how to battle stereotypes? Oh, you can't do this business because you're black. You can't do this business because you're brown. You can't do this business because you're a woman or because you're a man or you don't look a certain way in this industry. Oftentimes, there are things that we come up against in business that we never would have dreamed of were a part of our business structure. I want to start with Stacy for a moment because in this world of education, Stacy, where you're teaching children that they can be anything that they want to be, how are you helping them combat? stereotypes when it comes to them wanting to live their dreams, even as young people starting businesses. Stacy, 
I mean, I think first you have to have an awareness of what it is that you want to be, who it is that you want to be. And then once you can stand solid on yourself, then you just have to be able to clear the noise. I call it clear the noise, like pick and choose what you want to listen to. And if you're hearing people give you any kind of stereotypes or any kind of negative thought patterns on what it is that you're trying to do, um, I take the advice of ET. I don't take constructive criticism from anybody who haven't constructed anything. So, um, you know, I, and I've had that happen when I started the journey of, of starting a charter school. I had some very um, powerful people in the community to tell me, you know, say, you know, charter schools aren't for African American people. Therefore, this group that that was stereotypical. And I was like, well, what what makes our kids not to be able to deserve um, a, a certain school choice just because I'm an African American female? I, that didn't make sense to me. So maybe the norm says that it's not, but I, I don't tend to go with the, the norm. I tend to be a trailblazer if that's what I want to be. So that's what I chose to do. So I did it. And and we've been doing it for about 10 years now. And so you hear that a lot because a lot of times what people will do is they will subject their fears onto you through the form of a stereotype or their thoughts, you know? And so I just try to say, hey, I know what I want to do. And once I make that decision that that's what I want to do, then I'm going to listen for the conversations and the people of my tribe that's going to come and help me do the thing that you think I can't do, whether it's stereotypical or not. I mean, you know how many people I hear ask me about my hair color or the way I dress or, and I'm going to put my crop top on and I'm still going to find somebody to make my hair even bluer whenever somebody say something about it, because that's your thoughts, not my reality. That's interesting that you say that because the power of projection is real. People do have a tendency to project their fears onto us. And how do you combat that? You mentioned quieting the noise. How do you determine when to shut all that down? Because some people don't know how to escape the noise. When it start causing confusion. Mm. You start having your conversations with me and I start becoming unclear about what I thought I was going to do because I'm listening to all this outside noise, then I'm going to go within. I'm going to go find my quiet space so that I can hear my inner God and can hear my higher being because that's who direct my steps, not everybody else in the world. So, uh, and usually if I'm, if I'm going down a path and everything is connecting, then I know that that's the path I'm supposed to be on. I'm also smart enough to know that if I'm on a path and I'm having a lot of roadblocks, a lot of friction, I, I'm knowing, okay, maybe that's not the time for me to be there. So it's really about being intentional and being aware and, and operating in the present. But if you are unclear, unsure about what it is that you're trying to do, you will get mixed up in a lot of personal thoughts. I mean, I let people say what they want. You're going to say what you're going to say. Right. So I let you say whatever you're going to say. But then it's up to me to filter that through what's actually happening in my reality. And I've also learned that the higher up I went on this ladder, that it's, it's lonely because mm -hmm. now you have to off, I think, protect your space. Like I'm now before a lot of people fell off and I didn't understand. And I was like, no, where are you going? I want all these people around me. Now I'm like, oh, go ahead on, get on. Let me be by, <laughs> let me have some space by myself so I can think about it because the higher up you go and the, the decisions get harder, you have to interact with at a different level. And some people are just not on that level. And it's not that I can't value their opinions, but I have to understand and I have to look at where is this coming from? What value are you, what understanding, what, what are you bringing to the table for me to decide if I'm going to help that? But a lot of that, I, I just filter with, let me get into a space where I can hear my inner self. Mm, absolutely. Dr. Tierney, talk to us about that because so many people do want to level up in their real life space. You know, they feel like they've gotten it together. They've been on this journey for a moment. And then all of a sudden, here come Nancy Naysayer. <laughs> you know, how do you manage to level up when there are people saying you need to, you know, dumb it down? Mm hmm. So I want to take the focus off of the external Nancy naysayers and put it on the Nancy naysayers that are inside of us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are our own worst Nancy naysayer. Sometimes we are the one that's that's applying the stereotype to ourselves. And I say that with love because I was I was that person, you know, after getting my doctorate degree and thinking, oh, okay, I'm, I'm about to be the president of XY University because that was the trajectory that I was following. 
when everything started to kind of crumble around me, I was still working to get back into that arena because I had the stereotypical thought that because that was the degree that I had, that was the the experience, you know, some of the experience that I had, because that was the direction that I was going because I checked all those boxes, that that was the only thing that I can do, you know, and I held myself hostage to that for too long you know, for far, far too long when it took someone else external, actually it was Dr. Jackie to come along and say, don't you see all that you can do? Don't you see all that you've been doing? Like look beyond the title, look beyond the university, look beyond that role and look at exactly what you were doing. And so it actually, in my case, it took someone external to me to shut up the Nancy naysayer that was in me, you know, to help me to get outside of the stereotype that I was holding myself to. So I don't want us to become so preoccupied with what everybody else is saying as they are the Nancy naysayers. Sometimes you need to check yourself. You need to check what you're thinking because you may be the one that's getting in your own way. And here again, I say it all the time. This is why having a coach is so important. Having someone that has gone before you, having someone that can show you receipts of what they've done, you know, and how they got over, you know what I'm saying? Basically how they made it over, you know, that they can show you, here's how I navigated this, this area of my life or this, this trial or this tribulation. And here's how I can coach you to do the same, because those are the people that's going to help you to shut up the Nancy naysayer. They're the ones that's going to help you get out of that stereotype and get out of your own way so that you can ultimately get to the goal that you may not even see it. I, I did not see any of this. I did not see my business. I did not see me being on TV, coaching. and I did not see any of this, but Dr. Jackie did. And I'm so thankful that she did because in her shutting up the stereotype that I was holding myself to, I've been able to bust all kinds of glass ceilings that I, I wasn't even aware of. So get a coach, sugar. <laughs> get a coach, sugar. I love when she says that because I think it brings us to that space of how we grow. And I bring Art and Sheldana in for a moment because oftentimes people don't understand when you need to grow. And not everybody is on board <laughs> when you're trying to grow your business. Art and Sheldana, talk to our audience about that for a moment. How did you know when it was time for you to grow, to relocate, to you know build on, expand all the things that you do? To be in business for 28 years, you're you're not where you started. You've definitely surpassed that. How do you know when to grow? And what does that conversation look like between a couple who is doing this together? Because family business has its own ups and down and ebb and flow, but you guys do it well. What does that look like for people looking to expand? Well, I was a Nancy naysayer. <laughs> I was always the one like, wait a minute, let's don't do that right now. I was always he, the one said, okay, we can't be open on Sundays. So shops are not normally open on Sundays. And then mm -hmm. he wanted to open on Mondays. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, so that was me. So he, I was all one, one trying to hold back, but he thinks he could do anything. He's mm -hmm. like, no, we're going to do it. You know, let's do it. Let's just jump into it. And it has worked. So he, you know, he has helped me a lot, you know, seeing the things that we have accomplished, you know, in the 28 years because he's like, no, we're going to do this. This We can do this. I was the one more like, you know, just really scared. But now, you know, 28 years later, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's try it. You know. So this is like that marriage between what is business and what is passion art. What how does that work? And you you have the business acumen, Sheldana, operational and creative. How do these things work together? Because sometimes people can't see that they can't do it alone. Help us out. Well, I mean, the 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 biggest thing, uh, Dr. Jackie, is staying out of each other's way. Mm. Uh, I don't know anything about anything as it relates to doing hair. And, uh, you know, uh, my wife, you know, Sheldana probably knows a little bit about the business side of it. But um, but staying out of each other's way and compartmentalizing. And she's you know, it was it was a little rough there uh, initially, but she's given me the space to do what I do which is, you know, business and expansion and, uh, you know, marketing and so forth. And I don't get in her way operationally about how things go, no matter what I think, if I think, and I know just enough to be dangerous. So, I mean, I, but I don't say anything about it. I say, Hey, honey, that's your, that's your department. That's your lane. I'm going to leave that to you. You leave the business to me. So I think the biggest thing is uh, to respect each other's level of expertise and uh, you know, where you fit in. And uh, 
give the give your partner uh, the freedom to do that part of their job. So have you two always been in business together or did you have different career paths at one point? Well, uh, Sheldon has always been a hairstylist, um, but I um, I came from the investment business. I was a stockbroker mm-hmm. for uh, for Merrill Lynch and then Prudential Securities. And uh, essentially, I came into the the hair business because I was spending so much extra time uh, managing the business, uh, you know, running the finances, uh, doing the marketing and so forth that I was not doing my day job <laughs> uh, as efficiently uh, um, as I as I needed to be. And so uh, I walked away and then just decided to, you know, do the management of my own uh, my own assets and then as well. Um, you know, run the the business side of uh, of Sheldies. I think that what you stated was super important. So if you guys were listening, R said that he was an employed entrepreneur. And oftentimes being a double E is the space where we find ourselves when we're trying to determine, do I leave my day job to pursue my dream or do I take a pause and discover how to meld them together from time to time? Dr. Tierney, talk to us about that process of making the transition from my dream job, my life, what I want to do, and having to keep a day job in order to pay for my dream if I'm going to really live it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there there's this perception that entrepreneurship means that you have to be on the struggle bus. And that's not everybody's story. You know, for a lot of people, it's that your dream starts as a side hustle. So you're working at your W-2 job and you're growing your your business on the, you know what I'm saying, on the side. And for for a number of reasons, you you might stay with your W-2 for insurance pieces until your baby starts to grow, your baby being your, you know, your business grows to a point to where it can be self-sustaining. You don't have to absolutely 100 percent quit your job in order to, you know, totally start your business. Now, the thing that I will say is that you do have to put your weight behind your business. You can't treat your business like it's some hobby. You can't treat it as something that is optional or I might do it if I get to it. If you truly want it to grow, that doesn't mean you have to totally cut off everything else, but you do have to make sure that it does have your your focus. There's also um, examples where you might be 100% in your, you know, in your business, and then you have to back it up and punt, you know, and okay, well, let me go and get a a nine to five, because now we've had this life transition or this situation happen to where we need this steady income or, you know, this steady insurance or whatever it is. All of that is okay. The road to entrepreneurship is not, does not look the same for everybody. It is not a one size fits all. And there is no quote unquote, exact right way to do it. The right way to do it is the way that works best for you, for your industry, for your business, and for your family and for your lifestyle, period. Absolutely. When we come back after the break, let's talk for a moment about what it means to step into the space full time. We'll be back after the break. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Welcome back, everyone, to A Balanced Life. And as you can tell, being an entrepreneur requires you to have your head in the game. You can't decide one day, I don't want to do this anymore. Well, actually, you can. But have you given it your all before you decide to step out? I want to talk to Stacey about that for a moment, because there comes a time where you have to say, you know what? I need to pull the plug on this. And it may not be the full business. There just may be aspects and components of the business. Stacey, in your books, you talk about employees and how you work with them. And there are times when they're not all on board with where you're trying to go. When do you decide that maybe you need to take a detour in your dream in order to keep things moving forward? <laughs> when do I decide to let them take a detour? So they don't- <laughs> I love that transition there. <laughs> so they don't mess up um, my dream. 
Um, you know, I, I think it just depends on a, a lot of things. Like, for instance, when I started, before I started Zeka School of Arts and Technology, I was an educator and I was working as um, a, um, at Smart Start as an uh, early uh, childhood specialist for about seven years. And I would come home at night and be putting things in place for um me to be able to get to the space of opening um, a nonprofit because Zeka didn't start out as a, as a school. I was working on the nonprofit aspect of it. And then I was able to come across this grant. And once I got the grant, I was able to run an after school program. And so what would happen is I hired people to run the after school program and I still went to my regular nine to five because it wasn't enough money in the grant. It was only like $50,000 to start with. So it wasn't enough money that was going to pay me a salary so that I can be able to step out of my, my regular nine to five job. And then um, once I was able to secure some additional funding and some of my numbers grew and I got to the point where I can move over and employ myself to run the program, I just jumped. You know, but every day I had to work that nine to five and then I had to come home and work another, you know, eight to 12 to work on building up what I needed. And a lot of people thought I was crazy because I was spending a whole lot of time. I was tired. I was exhausted. I was gaining weight. I was doing all that. But I was determined. I was determined that eventually this this dream of mine was going to come into full full um, circle so that I could be able to move over and start doing the thing that I wanted to do because I knew I was, you know, told to start to start a school. But I think you determine when to make your moves just off of what makes financial sense to you as well. You know, because I also had two personal kids, so I couldn't just jump and be like, Oh, okay, to figure it out. And I think that's when I'm working uh, with some of my employees and I'm telling them, like I tell all my teachers, you guys should have a second stream of income because people love to complain about how teachers aren't making enough money. Well, you have a gift and talent. So figure out what your gifts and talents are and start you a second stream of income. And then, and I don't ever, you know, discourage that if your gift and talent can carry you into becoming an entrepreneur, I think that's what you should do because if that's what you want to do passionately, you should strive to do those things. But I think you have to be, you know, you have to make an assessment of when the time is right for you to fully transition and make sure that when you do that transition, you're win you're willing and ready to take all the good, the bad and ugly that's going to come with it, because you're going to have some good times and you're going to have some hard times. You're going to have some setbacks. You're going to have all of that. And if you are not determined then what will happen is you'll find yourself out in this entrepreneur boat and you'll be remembering what it felt like when it was just a hobby and it'd be easy for you to revert back to hobby status. So it really just determines on your grit. Like what do you want to do and how you want to look so that you'll know when you want to jump. You make a very valid point because sometimes we don't know when things are going to change. Art and Sheldana, we went through this pandemic and your industry was impacted by that. Talk to us about how you managed to stay the course during a pandemic, which was for a really long time. What did that look like for you and your industry? Sad. <laughs> yeah. Sad, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so essentially we were closed down for uh, for uh, 12 weeks, 11 or 12 weeks. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, it was a struggle. It was a struggle. Um, but I mean, we've been. Luckily for us, you know, we've been in the business and have had some success for a while. So we may not have had it as difficult as some some other people. But uh, and then the other things that were uh, available, uh, PPP and uh, EIDL, and then there were grants and so on and so forth and some things that we were able to utilize. But uh, but yeah, we just we knew that uh, that we have a you know solid business plan, a solid business, and that we'd be ready to, you know, rock and roll as soon as they open back up. But it it definitely was looking difficult there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> now, you all, especially being in the hair industry, some companies, some businesses, hair salons didn't recover because they didn't take advantage of a few of the things that you offered. But one of the things that you all do offer is great customer service. How do you help people in the industry help their clients understand some of the things you go through? Because oftentimes clients don't understand that it's a business, you know, outside of being a beauty salon, there's some real dollars and cents attached. How do you help clients and people who need the service, want the service, make the decisions to stay the course with you? 
Well, I mean, one of the things that uh, that I try to do is, um, you know, I try to to explain. I don't have a lot of day to day interaction, but I try to, you know, explain to to, to Sheldon and our other staff to, to, you know, just to let people know that, you know, we're not the we're not the we're never going to be the cheapest game in town town just because we you know the the amount of overhead and because of the level of service that we you know that we try to uh to deliver and we just try to explain that we're not you know we're not food line we're more like Wegmans you know um, so you know you you're going to play it's going to be a slightly higher price point but you're going to get incredible service when you come here Mm -hmm. I, I can appreciate that. So for those of you who are not in the DMV, who do not understand Art's analogy between <laughs> Food Lion and Wegmans, it's the difference between Safeway and Randall's, the difference between H-E-B and Kroger, or the difference between going to Edgar Drugs, Walgreens, Dwayne Reed, and Publix. So from wherever you are watching, if you can tell their levels of degrees, depending on the quality of service that you desire. And so businesses who believe in what they do, Companies who appreciate their staff and their clients will go the extra mile to make sure they're continuing to offer service, whether we were shut down for a pandemic, whether you were in a space or area where there was a hurricane or a tornado. Companies who believe in who they are and what they do will go the extra mile for their people because they not only believe in living their dream, but also the way we look helps us live our dream. Let's talk about that for a moment as we're kind of winding down. How important is it? how you look when you go out. Dr. Tierney, talk us to us about the power of presence and self-esteem that's attached to it. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I am my brand. So when you see me, you are seeing my brand, my business, and I carry myself in a way that when you see me, you know pretty much what you're gonna get when you interact with Dr. Tierney Enterprises LLC. From my website, um, to my processes and the systems that my, my clients interact with when they are doing everything from scheduling their session all the way down to payments to reminders and everything in between, you know, it all connects. You know, I want to make sure that when you see me, you are seeing a reflection of what you would receive when you work with me, particularly with me being in the life coaching um, space, it, it's a very intimate process, you know, and so I want to make sure that anytime you see me out and about that, what you see is what you get. You know, you never have to worry about, well, I saw her on a, on a balanced life and, and I kind of saw her on Instagram, but ooh, when I saw her in person or, you know, her website says this or it looked like it was easy, but then child, it was so many back in just all, oh, it was so confusing. No, I always think about the end user in every aspect of what I do and how I do it and how I show up. If you are lacking that confidence piece, if you are lacking and feeling that imposter syndrome and the insecurity, it's going to show up. It is absolutely positively going to show up. This is why it's important to not just dress up the outside. It's not enough just to have a really pretty website. It's not enough to have your hair styled and wear the right clothes and say the right things, you know, when you're in front of the, the right people. It really matters what you think of you. It matters what you think of your clients. Do you see your clients as just a transaction? If you do, if, if any of that is present, it's going to show and it will impact your bottom line. Trust me. Mm, that makes perfectly good, Stace. Stacey, talk to us about that for a moment because you're expanding, you're growing, you're doing so many things. And when your kids are out in the community, they know they go to your school. How do you accomplish that brand building from you, the legacy builder, all the way down the line and across the board? Mm -hmm. You know, as I was listening to what Dr. Tierney said, what popped in my mind was uh, character. So like, you know, yeah. early in the game, clean up your character, figure out what type mm -hmm. of person you are. I'm a very giving person. I'm a very loving person. I love to, you know, go towards the light and give light to others. I'm, 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 I see the hope. I see, you know, in everything. I always see my glass as half full versus half empty. And I'm very confident in who I am as a person. And every time I interact with a child or a family, I'm always looking at it from a standpoint of what can I give to you that will help make your situation help make your situation better and help you be able to be in control of making your situation even better. So my character traits within me is something that, you know, I had to work on over the years because it was there, but you don't know it 
and you may not always operate from that side and you can't articulate that so much. So now I'm in a space where I can do that. And then when you go down to your brand, you know, the population that I serve, you know, you have to be relatable. You have to be somebody that they can relate to. So I'm just a little old poor girl from the hood. I'm going to always be that person, right? I'm going to always be from the hood, but I don't have to be of the hood. So I've mm-hmm. learned how mm-hmm. to operate in different settings. And so when I said earlier that there's people in the community who might say, well, I don't like the way she dressed because you catch me when I'm not at my nine to five. I might have on some jeans and a, and a crop top of my brand, right? It's respectable, but that's just, I'm still young. That's what I want to do. And that's what I'll do. But I teach kids that and I teach people around me that is how you interact with people is how you interact in your situation that's going to make a difference in the lives of others. Because of my jeans and my crop top, I can see a teenage girl who now will listen to what I have to say because she don't think that I'm being some overly Ph.D., smart person and there's nothing wrong with that because i'm working on my phd and i'm almost at that that juncture too take me in a boardroom and i'm going to have a suit on and i'm going to have you know my makeup and everything that i needed to do so for me i can operate in any room that you put me in i know how to switch and i don't like to say cold switching because what i'm gonna bring to you is my authentic language i'm gonna bring to you my my what i you know what i grew up with in my experiences that's all we can bring to any table is who we are you know, so I've heard people say, oh, you, you know, not, you're not going to be successful. For my 11th grade teacher, if you're still out there who said you're not going to be anybody because of the way you slice your verbs and cut your and, and use your grandmother's dialect, I'm somebody and I still might <laughs> slice a verb every now and then. So you can only bring you to the table. But what you got to do is improve you so that you can start bringing the best you to the table. Right. And I've also learned that if I come to your table and you don't want me, I'll create my own table. So I think that that's important, being able to create your own table. I want to give Arden Sheldana the last words in this block. And Arden Sheldana, my question is, what is one tip or word of advice that you would give people in your industry to keep moving forward? You want to take that? Ooh, you want me to take that? <laughs> um, I, I would just uh, suggest um, focus, absolute focus and determination and uh, like one of the young ladies was saying earlier, um, don't listen to anybody. Don't listen to naysayers. Believe that you can do anything and uh, and make a plan. Always have a plan, but uh, but have supreme confidence in yourself and believe that you can do anything. I like that. Thank you all for watching today and thank you for sharing these tips and tidbits. When we come back, I'll give my reflections. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Welcome back, everyone, to A Balanced Life. And as you can tell, when we say this all the time, so we're not trying to scare you out of entrepreneurship. However, being your own boss is not for the faint of heart. It requires you to be sold out for you 100%. It requires determination, patience, and you got to love yourself. You got to be in that space where you feel as if you can accomplish anything. Honestly, we're so busy out here self-doubting that other people are really afraid of our potential. So when you see that as a perspective for yourself, it should allow you to feel as if you can move yourself forward. Keep going, keep moving, keep thriving. It is for this reason that a balanced life is able to be what it is able to be. From the things that I do on a regular basis to where I am now, it gives me the space and the confidence to say, I can do this and I was meant for it. And I say that to you, you can do this and you were meant for it. Thanks for watching. Bye now.